A very good morning to everyone and welcome to the second day of uh, the um, BSBF webinar on um, uh, big science organizations strategic plans, um, procurements and flagship projects. Um, yesterday was the first day in which uh, we had with us uh, CMAT, CERN, European XFEL, ESRF, ESS, ESS Bilbao, FAIR, and LIBS. And today we are going to have other important big science organizations with us. We are going to have EMBL with Evelyn uh, Kusrat, uh, ISA with Frank Gernas, ISO with Roberto Tamay, ES with Miguel Núñez Cajigal, Fusion for Energy with Victor Saez López and Leonardo Biagioni, Mirra with Professor Hamid Abderrahim, and SCA organization with Laura Olmos. Um, uh, you, uh, the audience, will be able to participate uh, and interact with the speakers after their each presentation through the questions and answers module of Zoom. Please do not do not use the chat module. Uh, we will use the questions and answers. Those questions and answers will be passed to uh, to, to the speakers for uh, answering um, after each presentation. Uh, we will also animate a little bit uh, the the webinar with some uh, with some polls. Um, uh, the first um, 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 batch will be to animate you and to uh, keep you awake um, early in the morning, and then the last one related with conclusions, because the webinar will will, will conclude uh, around uh, twelve with the conclusions of the webinar and give me some uh, news uh, of the next webinar that we have in, uh, in ahead of us with the intervention of, of Roberto Trigo from CDPI. So please go ahead, go in, uh, in, uh, in the application and you will be able to interact with us um, having a little bit more insight of uh, which is the, 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 the type of audience we have. Nowadays, we are with the pandemic. We are um, uh, working from different places. So this is a funny question: uh, Where are you working at this moment? Now, watching this this um, this uh, webinar, are you at home uh, with the kids uh, surrounding, or are you at work, uh, comfortable but uh, in a more serious environment, or maybe you are at the beach uh, uh, from the beach? So let's see that mostly people are at home. Eh? So I think this is a lesson learned that we have to have because um, um, working relations uh, have changed uh, in, in, in those days. So it's a 50-50 more or less, 60-40. Okay, thank you very much, Virginia. Let's go with the next one. Okay, let's check which is your knowledge about Granada, okay? What, what, which is your best uh, knowledge about Granada? Um, uh, Alhambra, Ifnif Dones, Sierra Nevada ski resort, uh, best capacity in Spain, um, uh, the beach. Um, I don't think there is a beach, but uh, who knows? No, no, there is no beach, of course. So um, please, uh, you can insert multiple answers. So um, if you uh, know two things, uh, do it, okay? Okay, I see that the most uh, populated thing is uh, La Alhambra. It's a great this historic place. Uh, I recommend you when you will be there to visit it. And Sierra Nevada Ski Resort as well. Huh? No, not many people know that uh, in uh, Granada there is a huge and very high quality ski resort. And of course, our colleagues from Instituto Astrofisico de Andalucía are a very exa a great example of science uh, in Granada. Very good, uh, Virginia. The next one, let's, let's see. Among uh, the previous one, no, okay. Uh, 
I think this is not uh, the, the previous one. Uh, okay. Do you think this is a useful for your company to organize this type of biannual events of industrial opportunities of the European Big Science Organization? I hope everyone should say yes. Okay. It's sort of, this is the message. Perfect. Thank you very much. And, and I think with this concludes the, the starting uh, slide or round. Okay. So without uh, more delays, let's go to the serious part and uh, let's go to our uh, to pay attention to our speakers because they are here to tell us extremely important uh, strategic plans, 2020-2021 procurements and flagship projects on their um, big science organizations. The first one on the list is EMBL, Evelyn. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, uh, go ahead and the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Um, just maybe first to confirm, can you see the screen right now or not that I just sharing? We are hearing you, but we cannot see the screen and yet. Now, but it now it, oh, okay. we, we can see it. Perfect. Perfect. Then we can start. Thank you very much, first, uh, Yoya, for organizing all this event and to all the CDTI anyway. Uh, it's been a great help and a pleasure to participate today. Um, my name is Evelyn Kudras, and I'm the head of the procurement at the EMBL in Heidelberg. And today I'm very happy to start the day as we are and to present you the EMBL, the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. We are the only um, big science organization in the field of life science, so it's probably quite new to the audience. And I'm pleased to jump in the presentation and show you who we are, what we're doing, talk about our procurement, strategic plan and flagship projects. So just let's start, I think, okay. Okay, so what is EMBL? EMBL is the Europe uh, flagship laboratory for the life sciences. We are an intergovernmental organization that's been funded in uh, 1974 and has, is financed by 27 member states and is located on six locations. We do employ roughly 1,800 uh, people right now um, at all sites. The first site you will see on the left is the most recent one that has been opened. This is the site in Barcelona. And Barcelona is, uh, specializes in tissue biology and disease modeling. The building you're actually seeing is actually the building of the PRBB, um, and, uh, which is the Barcelona, uh, the Barcelona Biomedical Center. And also in this building is the Center for Genomic Regulation, so which allows us to uh, partner with all these institutions present on site. The site in the middle is Grenoble, that's the site in France, which is a center for structural biology. And we share the campus there as well with strategic partners like the ESRF, where uh, yesterday Ingrid had a talk about what they are doing, and the ILL also. And then we come to Hamburg. Hamburg is also a site um, in research and, and structure royal biology and based on the site of the DESI campus, which is the German synchrotron, and we facilitate, uh, it facilitates their our partnership as well to use the synchrotron radiation and the laser facilities. And then the three other sites, the one um, on the left is Heidelberg, that's the one I'm currently based, and this is the administrative headquarters. We host the five research units and core facilities. The five research units, for instance, is genome biology, developmental biology, structural, computational biology, and so on. Then we have the EMBL EBI, which is the European uh, Bioinformatic Institute located at Hingston, close to Cambridge in the UK. And this is basically the, uh, the home for the big data in biology. So they are developing database software tools, um, sharing data all across the world to uh, the life science audience. And last but not least, the site in Rome, which um, was created in 1999 and was more at the time a mouse biology station and is now um, has evolved to an epigenic and neurobiology um, station. So this is just a brief summary of all the key figures I just mentioned now. Very interesting on this slide are the 63 million daily requests on average that the EBI um, data resources uh, got in 2019, for instance. So just to show the dimensions of, of their activities there. Um, I think they're also dealing with 307 petabyte of raw data storage, which is a huge amount um, of data sharing throughout the world. What are our missions? So EMBL, 
was set up to promote molecular biology across Europe. And for this, we have five missions. The one, obviously, the first one is to perform excellent fundamental research in, my, in molecular biology, but also to offer a lot of services to scientists uh, all around the world. This can be expertise we share, this can be space we provide, this can be equipment uh, we share to all, um, uh, to all member states and users in the world. Training is also a very big topic at the EMBL. We train, we have a training center, we train scientists, students, teachers, visitors. Um, yeah, we, we, training is, is really um, a, a key thing, organizing conferences uh, and so on. We also actively engage in technology transfer and industry relation. And then we show that later on on the slides, uh, which are the program we have currently in place uh, towards the industry. And we also coordinate and integrate European life science research. So how is this institution, the EMBL finance? I thought it's good to show a bit the strategic plan we have and the financial facts behind that so that you understand where do we spend the money and where do we get it from? So EMBL is planned on a five years um, cycle. This is called the indicative scheme. And the current one is gonna be finished at the end of 2021. So that we're ready for preparing the program 2022-2026. And this is the mission of our current director general uh, since the beginning of 2019. It is um, Edith Hurt. And she has developed already a plan for the next uh, indicative scheme. The new direction uh, of the research, I'm going to show you briefly that have been identified so far. Um, they will allow us and enable us to gain a molecular insight into biodiversity and environment, but also to integrate environmental information into the understanding of organism also understand the impact of human and the environment and the other way around and provide solutions to global challenges and at least um, to, uh, um, to understand the life at the molecular level. To give a bit more background on what it means exactly, this program will help addressing some of the societal challenges. And I think the pandemic is a good one actually to see uh, the, the uh, measures that, have, uh, that EMBL has implemented also. Um, so, for instance, it would be concerning antibiotic resistance, climate change, pollution, pandemics, and so on. So, just to come on the financial facts, um, EMBL in 2019, to give you an idea, had a net income from 200, 266 million. And I want to show you a short repartition. Um, so, 41% is coming, obviously, from the member states, is a member states contribution. And the big trunk in blue, opposite to this 41 in purple, are the uh, external grant funding. And you will see on the right the repartition of the grant funding um, by country. So, uh, basically, the United States with the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, is a big one uh, financing the MBL, the Wellcome Trust, which is mostly for the EBI in Hingston or the ECERC grants and a lot of German uh, funding like the BMBF and the DFG as well. How do we spend this 266 million we got in 2019 and that we get regularly and hopefully some more funding in the future as well to support our activities? Like most of the institutions, 60% of this money is going to staff, uh, staff costs and operating costs and roughly 7% in equipment. And you will see the repartition, uh, what's going into training on the right side, what's going to scientific um, research and so on. <clears throat> so the next slide is about um, procurement and the diverse areas. I think for the audience, it's interesting to see in which areas do a life science organization invest in. So we do invest a lot because we are a wet lab mostly. Uh, we do invest a lot in microscopy. Um, microscopy has been increasing in the last years and will continue increasing um, because there is a lot of imaging processing that uh, science needs and we spend, for instance, since the beginning of the year around 10 million euros on microscopy. Uh, the biggest part um, is due to the cryo-electron microscope that we recently bought for a new building that's going to open and I'm going to come to that later on the slide uh, where we spend 7 million there. Obviously, as a wet lab, um, mostly at the sites, apart from the EBI in Hingston, we do buy a lot of laboratory equipment and consumables. Laboratory equipment, for instance, can be centrifuges, minus 80 freezers, incubators, and so on, and a lot of chemicals, enzymes to do the daily work. So it's a lot of low value orders, but on a regular basis every day. So roughly 8 million so far, um, but much more to come. 
IT services, and at this stage, um, I wanted to put the EBI first on the slide as they do make um, the, they do spend the most in that category, obviously, as a data center. And they also have received, um, as well as the whole of the MBL, they've been awarded a 44 million pound um, fund from the strategic priority funds that are delivered by the UK Research and Innovation uh, Program for spending between 2020 and 2024. So this is gonna be spent um, and so far has been spent 7.4 million in all um, IT services. So infrastructure, virtual infrastructure, storage, uh, network infrastructure, and so on. The same obviously um, applies for the other side, but on another scale, so not uh, that much, but we do also um, spend money on, on all uh, IT cloud computing and so on. Um, so far this year, 1.6 million was spent in that category, but much more to come as well as we do have a lot of building on construction that will require uh, data analysis, uh, analysis and so on. So and the, to come to the next category I just mentioned, this is the construction part. Um, at least at the MBL on the headquarters, there is always something going on, always new refurbishment, new construction project. Here I've just mentioned two minor ones at the moment, um, but there are more to come. And um, a biggest project now, which will start in 2021, is the refurbishment and the new building on our site in Rome, which is gonna be a project of 8.7 million. That's gonna be coordinated by the CNR, which is the National Research Council in Italy. Uh, but EMBL is um, also helping in the planning and the design um, and will, um, will basically go through all the execution and supervise the execution of the project. Then I thought it was very interesting for the audience to see what is the MBL doing towards the industry. We do not have any industry and Asian officer as we do have, as, as all other big science organizations do have, but we do have a lot of program in place um, towards the industry and the industry relation. So uh, here is just to mention four that we have. Um, the three of them are based in Heidelberg, but there are cross sites, uh, they're just based here in the region. This is the corporate partnership program, uh, which is a platform um, helping facilitating and creating organizing events training with the industry to the bright audience of public. Um, the second one is the technology transfer program where um, the EMBL um, emblem, which is the EMBL enterprise management technology transfer G uh, GmbH is an affiliate and commercial arm of the, the laboratory and taking care of all technology transfer um, matters and topics and currently has a portfolio of thousand inventions roughly. The venture capital is also based in Heidelberg and invests in core technologies throughout Europe. Um, and basically yeah, for the, the, fo the focus of them is creating uh, companies in life sciences and, and sponsoring them. And then the EMBL EBI has got a special industry program that is a subscription based one for companies that use their um, data and resources a lot. So you will see on the next slide a few of the current partners um, of the. Sorry, you will see on the next slide a few of the current partners of the program of EMBL in Heidelberg and current partners of the program um, of the EBI industry program. Let's come now to the flagship, uh, flagship project. So we've got one um, big one in Heidelberg, which we can't miss at the moment when we're coming on site. This is the so-called Imaging Center, and that's supposed to be um, opening in 2021, and hopefully will look like that. Um, this will be a unique microscopy service facility for high and ultra high resolution electron and light microscopy techniques. Um, this is a cooperation with all the leading microscopy um, industrial companies like Leica, for instance, Thermo Fisher and SAIS. And the center will be open for all science, visiting scientists from all over the world, as well as for the industry partners. I added a few uh, background information on the financial aspect of this project. The whole project is about 48 million. Of these 28 million is for the building itself and 20 million will be used for the um, initial equipment of microscopes and supporting IT infrastructure. So for instance, the cryo microscope I just mentioned before, the 7 million ones were bought for this building that's gonna open next year. And the BMBF, um, the German um, uh, funding, 
as providing the largest financial contribution of this center with a funding of roughly 30 million. So this is the state of the building right now, though now there are more windows I saw this morning as I came on the campus. So I think we're right on time. I wanted also to address um, a very exotic project just to show what life science can be doing, not only getting wet at the bench when pipetting, but also getting wet on a ship, on a boat, cruising the oceans, for instance, like we had in the past. So it's a past project, but it's still going on. And I think it's a very important one. This is what I wanted to mention it there. It's the Tara Ocean uh, Expedition Project that was run between 2009 and 2013. And at the time, the, the aim of the, and the mission of this um, boat um, trip was to study marine plankton. Why study marine plankton? Because this is a very important marker of the state of our planet. Um, so basically, EMBL um, group leader at the time, Eric Senti, um, coordinated the project with Etienne Bourgois, which is the president of the Terra Expedition Foundation. And we equipped uh, the boat, you can see up there, with all uh, laboratory equipment, and, they were, and the boat was sailing the oceans. And here are key figures just to summarize the extent of the expedition, how many cruise members, many, many scientists of many laboratories involved, um, 35,000 samples collected. Um, so it was a huge expedition. And I think the EBI is probably still, uh, EBI is probably still analyzing all the data. And I just mentioned this project uh, because it's still going on. And now um, the Terra mission is to study the microplastic pollution in the major rivers of Europe. And recently from May to November, it's been sailing across the rivers, sailing um, across the Mediterranean Sea and the ocean on the coast and try to understand the microplastic fragmentation in rivers and predict their dispersion towards the ocean. And here again, big role and contribution of the EBI um, just uh, because of the storage of the genomic data produced by the expedition. So here are very um, key few figures as well to summarize the expedition and the extent of the expedition. And on the last part, I would like to finish this presentation on the role that EMBL is playing uh, currently with the um, COVID-19 pandemic and the activities that have started straight uh, after the outbreak actually in, um, in March, where the EBI, for instance, um, straight at the beginning of the pandemic facilitate the setup of national SARS-CoV-2 data hubs across, Europe's, across Europe. Um, these hubs are used by public health agencies and research centers and all the data that is shared there and making available to all these uh, agencies are sequences, expression data, protein function, structure, literature, and a lot of, of other data. And so this is just to show um, the, the impact and the fast reaction that um, EMBL and in this case, uh, more precisely the EBI um, uh, had. But also a lot of other activities are going on. Um, I think in, in March, we had 23 project submission from enthusiastic scientists that said, hey, we want to help. Uh, we want to help in the pandemic as good as we can by sharing expertise, sharing our knowledge, our equipment, uh, collaborating with hospital researcher, with university exploring synthetic antibodies to stop coronavirus and hosting a lot of uh, virtual conferences on that topic as well. Um, this is it basically today on my side for uh, this presentation. And I hope um, that I've managed very briefly to show you what the MBL is doing um, in the life science as one of the only uh, big science organization here. And when do we spend the money that we get from our, spend, uh, from our member, state, uh, member states um, and all the, the other contribution. Thank you very much. And if there are any questions, I can answer. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Thank you very much uh, for the excellent presentation. I think it is important to point out that you have a, a huge amount of activities not only if, um, procurement uh, in procurement of the self things, also procurement together with industry on the age of the uh, of the state of the art of technology, specifically yeah. in, in microscope, my, microscopy, yeah. in the in the, and um, I think this, this 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 was great and thank you for the interesting presentation. We will see if now we have some uh, questions from uh, from the audience, Belen. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, so far, Evelyn, we have received a few questions uh, for you. Uh, first one, uh, are the IT procurements expected to include uh, analytics and software development services, or is this partly hardware infrastructure? Uh, 
So there is a lot of hardware infrastructure. Uh, I'm talking on behalf of the EBI, who is mostly doing uh, the biggest part of the data anyway, but um, it's, uh, it's a lot of infrastructure, but at the other side, it's also um, IT services, consulting services also. Uh, mm -hmm. For the EBI, for instance, uh, the tendering will depend on uh, the kind of funding received. So if it's, uh, we, we very differ uh, differentiate at the MBL the kind of funding we receive for the tendering. If we receive internal fundings, they will be done according to the MBL rules and regulations. And if um, we receive external funding, like this is the case, for instance, for the EBI, um, most of the of the special funding I mentioned before are done, for instance, through the Crown Commercial Services platform. This is a tendering platform, and all the, the current call for tenders can be seen there under a specific frame number. If some people would need some information on that, they can contact uh, me directly, my email address at the beginning of the presentation, and then okay. I could connect with the, with the different sites. Um, it's important to know, so the MBL, we have the, the head of procurement, uh, myself is based here in Heilberg, but we have, for instance, at the EBI, the procurement manager, Andrew Bone, who is taking care of all the ordering uh, of the EBI, and we have on-site um, a lot of purchase officers as well for the uh, taking care of the, mm -hmm. of the normal. But I mean, for any questions, you can also refer to the okay. handbook for the, our tendering procedure that's okay. on. Uh, okay, thank Thanks. you very much, Evelyn, for your answer. Mm -hmm. Um, second and third uh, questions are related. Uh, where companies can find information about following procurements and tenders? Do you have a website or? Um, so we uh, yesterday I know the question appeared quite a lot as well. If there is a registration platform for our, uh, suppliers, we do not have that um, yet. Most of the things we're doing is selective tendering. So we. If we know the market, we will address uh, companies we've been working for. We try to include new companies through uh, contacts that are coming from the laboratory directly. For instance, uh, where, where uh, scientific people know of new uh, companies they would like to address. Mm -hmm. And the tendering platform, we do not have one in, in place now. But as I mentioned, a lot of tendering exercises, for instance, for the EBI can be found on another platform. And for instance, construction work are done through the architect and engineer offices, and they can be seen as well on the platform of the respective partners. Um, a lot of our spending is low value orders. So for instance, it's consumables, um, mm -hmm. very low value orders under 12,500 euros. So the, our thresholds are very different than a lot of the other big science organization. Um, so, from, from that perspective, the best is always to get in touch with us and then we make the contact with the groups. Um, we, always, we always spend a lot of time also to include SME. We think that if we do for the kind of tendering we have, if we go out on a, on a, a tender platform, we might scare um, small and medium enterprise because they might not have the resources in place. We need to keep our uh, procurement quite flexible and very uh, lightweighted and not too bureaucratic um, because we want to attract SMEs as well. And we do really search the contact with the industry. So we do really like to negotiate with people on site as well and, and maybe not scare people off with a big, heavy tendering exercise. So please do contact us or do contact me. I will refer to the different sites um, for projects. Okay, thank, okay you. thank you for your answer. Um, no more questions. Uh, maybe just to remind the audience, as you mentioned, that the, they can find more information uh, about the EMBL and all the big science infrastructures in the BSBF uh, procurement handbook. Thank exactly. you, Belen. Thank you, Belen. Thank you, Jean, as well. A nice day thank, to you all. Thank, thank you, you. Belen. Thank you for, uh, for your presentation and your answers. And also thank you for the effort of making the life of the SMEs uh, easier. I mean, uh, just uh, getting out uh, bureaucracy and all of that. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's a great, great approach. Thank you very much. And a nice day to you all. Thank you. Very well. Okay, now we are going to pass uh, to our next speaker. Um, uh, our next speaker is Frank Gernes from ISA. Um, hi, Frank, how are you? Uh, what's, what, what's the weather to the, uh, today in, in Nordvik? Fantastic for work. It's a okay. beautiful I and, rainy I, day. We, we all understand very well. <laughs> I, I miss a fireplace and a dog, but I have to stay professional for the presentation. So uh, Very well. Okay, uh, so Frank today is going to show us um, uh, the strategic plan, the plan procurements for 2021 and the flagship projects, mainly that the steam uh, estimate from uh, the last uh, ministerial conference that uh, um, and uh, we are uh, really anxious to, 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 to see your presentation. So Frank, um, go ahead, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Jorge. 
So very good. My, my name is Franck Germes. I, um, I work in uh, Nordvec. You understand for the European Space Agency, I'm taking care of procurement for uh, telecommunication and uh, Earth observation satellite. Um, I don't go to ESA, but basically what you know, what you should know about ESA is the number of uh, member states are uh, in the in the footer there. All the flags are there. We have 22 member states plus some associated uh, some associated states which participate to some particular program. We are a, a full range of space agency, uh, or space science, astronaut exploration, which is more robotic exploration, also observation, launchers, certain number of elements. Technology is a bit flagged here, but because we have a dedicated directorate for technology, but you will see that technology is in every of these different uh, directorate uh, and discipline of, uh, of satellite. Um, as uh, Rory was uh, hinting to, we had, uh, maybe it was, uh, we were lucky of uh, having people in good mood in a beautiful Spanish city, which was Sevilla, but as shown on the screen, um, on, the, on the left side of the screen, we got a very high level of subscription of the, of the minister of, of, the, of the different um, member states. So in terms of, so I was mentioning that, uh, let's say the, we got a very level, high level of subscription, even more than what we requested in the different activities of, uh, of ESA, uh, which are the one which are there. I'm going to give you a few examples of this uh, flagship program. You can see here, we are maybe megalomania because our playground is the universe. Huh? You can really see that in the scientific satellite program, we have some, uh, planetary exploration mission, which are what we call solar system explorers, which go to Mercury, close to the sun, etc. And the one which are in development are the one which are mainly on the top of the, of the slide, which is uh, here, if you can see that. Below, this is a bit more close to fundamental science. And this is a, a lot of mission to look at uh, also exoplanet, characteristic of exoplanet, etc. And there you can also see many which are under development and all of that represent also opportunities for industry to provide not the prime contractorship, most of them are already selected, but uh, some equipment or some, uh, some subsystem. Also interesting here, it's the, on, the, on the top corner there, you have uh, CubeSat and CubeSat is maybe also a very interesting way to access uh, for industry to, to access space without having to do with haute couture type of satellite. And this is uh, a lot of development in the recent years and uh, uh, you, it could be a good opportunity for you to look at that. Now, similarly, if you look in, um, uh, so you have on the, on the left side here, uh, Earth observation satellite, which are of three categories, the meteorology, the Copernicus, and Copernicus was a big element of the last ministerial approval where we got 2.5 billion euro for six different missions, which is done in collaboration with the European Commission. And um, uh, there we are just negotiating the, the prime contract and there will be opportunities also for, uh, for suppliers there. We have also in the Earth exploration, let's say Earth observation area, some scientific area where we really try to put the technology to the maximum uh, that what can physics can provide. And this is uh, what we have there. I don't go into detail. It's just to give you an overall impression of the number, the huge number of, uh, of projects we have. Similarly, here you can see for uh, the launchers area where we have the flagship program, which are Ariane 6 and Vega C. But also there are some um, significant maintenance activity on ground, uh, which is uh, to be done in Kourou or on the test facilities, which we, we may have in Estec, as well as uh, some real R&D opportunities for future launchers uh, being reusable or, uh, or uh, of a different, different kind. Um, what is important is, I mean, here we have, I do yourself an espresso version of what was the subject of today's meeting, similarly to what uh, CDTI has uh, organized today. There was the Industrial Space Days that took place a couple of weeks ago in uh, virtually this time, normally they are in, in Nordvec in the Netherlands, but this time it was like we are doing now. And all the presentations are available at the site here. I will, if I have a couple of minutes at the end, I can show you what, what we have. What you also see, and this is really the main area where should we look at all opportunities, is our uh, 
portal for procurement is called uh, emits and there you have also the url where uh, i'll try to show you a bit later on you have also how to access uh, registration how to look at invitation to tender but also the the detailed plan in a consolidated way for the whole of ESA. How to do business with ESA is, as uh, others were mentioning, is a uh, part of this, uh, uh, there is a dedicated chapter in the procurement handbook, uh, which is published by uh, BSBF. So I give you a few examples of um, what are uh, the areas of technology, because we place more than a thousand contracts a year. And so there is a really a lot some of them are really several hundred million, but there's a lot of contract, which is a few hundred thousand euros, which is a very good opportunities for companies that never work for space and that too would like to make the, the transition for space activities. So here, this is the basic technology development uh, program, which is uh, with a significant budget uh, of a hundred million. And this is not contracts of 10 million, it's really small contracts of a few hundred thousand euros. So there is a lot of opportunities in the the different field of ESA for the, the different pillars which are there. And this is really in line with a, uh, let's say there is a roadmap uh, for uh, technology development to be sure that we stay within an evolution of a linked competitiveness of European industry. Another example, which is also a very good opportunity for companies that companies or, uh, you know, uh, uh, PhD students or anybody that is doing some research for something else than space and would like to see whether there can be some spin-off for space activities. And we have what we call the Open Space Innovation Platform, uh, which is accessible again to this URL. And this is really to think out of the box. You can really have just studies, you can propose whatever, and we see whether this is eligible and if this could be uh, we could redirect to some particular program uh, to be subject of funding. Another example is uh, the general support and technology program, which is also uh, dealt with by the technical directorate, which is really also addressing all the different uh, field of, of space and uh, being earth observation, being um, a telecommunication uh, or uh, navigation, etc. And there you have three type of element. The first one is ESA uh, know what we want and we have some work plan which we publish and there will be most of these activities will be subject of uh, invitation to tender on a competitive manner to mature technology which are today at a low uh, at a low technology uh, readiness level. Uh, this is really uh, something where uh, we want to increase the, the maturity of, of technology. The second element, and this is, uh, I think, very interesting for uh, companies that do not exactly have the, the skills to do the first element, uh, and that want to push their own technology to be more competitive on a particular market. There we have a very large open call, which is uh, allowing company to, as long as they, they respect the eligibility criteria, to propose their own activities in direct negotiation, and this is, uh, completely eligible as long as uh, there is also some co-funding uh, proposed by the industrial partner. Last element of this is uh, when the technology is really mature uh, uh, and it has been qualified on ground, you still want to see whether this is uh, very good in orbit. And we have, uh, this is a bit like we had for the CubeSat I mentioned earlier, uh, smart, uh, the, the fly element, which is to make in orbit validation demonstration. Another example, and this is, you can see there is a very huge budget there, is on the telecom for the, the, the communication satellite area. We have really a big boost at the last ministerial conference with uh, three main areas uh, of a pillar program. One is 5G. So 5G is not only uh, to be a revolution on ground, but we really see how we can use space to uh, increase the performance of 5G. Uh, safety and security in this period, especially of uh, cyber, cyber security threat, we uh, really want to secure that we have a very enhanced technology in that field, as well as laser and optical communication uh, means between satellite or from satellite to, to ground. 
Next to that, we have the generic program lines, which is a bit like for GSTP. So you have some studies which are for future preparation and core competitiveness, which is 700 of million of uh, opportunities. Is the same. You have a, a global frame, and their industry can propose to push their technology forward to make it more competitive and possibly non space technology to make it uh, more, um, let's say, usable for space. When there is a more serious project, we go into some kind of PPP and public private partnership projects. And we also have a dedicated program for downstream uh, application, what we call business application space solution. So to use space technology for on-ground application. And this can be to, uh, you know, you take some raw data from space and you develop some services on ground for internet in the train, for uh, uh, telemedicine, for a lot of different possibilities. The, the world is open in that respect. So I don't want to confuse you with another line of uh, uh, of opportunities, but this is for scientific mission because we really push the technology to the maximum of what physics can allow. Uh, there, there is also dedicated scientific uh, R&D program, which is also with significant amount of money. So I don't go into the detail, but if you are interested, there are some publication, uh, the, the white paper where you have uh, uh, some procurement plan uh, for all these activities which are uh, presented there. If I go a little bit in one of the, the topics is for instance, and this is more in the context of the GSTP. So, uh, and this will be further discussed next year uh, in, the, in the dedicated parallel session about materials, but there are, for instance, in uh, advanced material, there are three main areas. They are the advanced material and processes, smart manufacturing, additive manufacturing, and all of that we have, again, so for those companies that would be interested to look at that in more detail, there is more than 26 activities, and this is subject of a publication where you can know more about this if you want to know, to look at the, let's say, the technical description of these activities in more detail and the, and the strategic plan associated to it. So it's a uh, Overall, uh, I must say, uh, it can be a little bit confusing, but I just wanted to summarize where you get a lot of information per type of, uh, of activity. So more for uh, astronaut and human and robotic exploration, you have a dedicated, uh, let's say, access on, uh, on the ESA webpage. Uh, similar for telecommunication, that you have two, one for business application and the other one for the overall uh, technology uh, development on what we call the ARTES program. I would advise for those who never work with us, go first to uh, open space innovation platform. There you can have some interesting uh, elements. We are uh, acknowledging that it can be quite a maze to go into ESA and try to find your way if you're not completely used to this. So next to this open space innovation platform, what we are currently developing is uh, what we call a one-stop shop, which will be the single downstream gateway, which is the front door, let's say, of the ESA, uh, of ESA, where we would from there direct any companies which want to better understand the way we work in the particular kind of activities where, you know, it's like a concierge that you would have in an hotel and you would uh, get a better knowledge of that. Um, so if I have a couple of minutes, I can just show you the example, for instance, of uh, EMITS. So EMITS is our uh, procurement portal. Now here, what you have is the list of the open invitation to tender. But you can have, for instance, if you just want to look at the total list of intended invitation to tender, Frank, there you have. If, Frank, if, if you want to show um, and the Emmet portal, you have to share uh, your Google um, um, browser and not uh, the 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 PowerPoint um, screen. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, sorry, I don't. Can you share? The best way yeah. is unshare your your screen, then select yeah, your, exactly. your, your screen and and, and do it. yeah, perfect. Now, okay. So here you can see, uh, this is for instance, the list of intended invitation to tender. So they are not yet published. And you can see, for instance, if you want to know a bit more about one particular activity, 
you have the budget, you have the participating state, the directorate, point of contact, etc. Uh, like was mentioning earlier, you have to register as a company to be able to access the detailed information of each invitation to tender. So you would need to go to uh, what I flag here, entity registration. We have also some, um, let's say, some uh, yellow pages. If you want to team up with other companies, you want to better understand who does what in Europe and space, you can go to industry information, which is there. And next to the, all of the ESA activities, what can also be interesting is to go to the legal and to the entities. And this is what our prime contractors are publishing for opportunities for them also to submit proposal. So that's um, one element. And then let me just finish quickly to show you. And I really invite you to, because there you have all the details for uh, the different area. You see my screen with the industrial space days? Yes, we, we can see um, your screen. So here you go to presentation. And then you can see the full agenda and all the presentation that were uh, done by uh, the different companies, uh, the different, uh, my different colleagues in the different area. And there you have uh, all the details. Uh, you can go, uh, okay, I just show an example here. Okay, and there you have all the opportunities, all the details. So with this, I would like to close my presentation. And uh, thank you for your presentation. It was it was very clear um, also for me that uh, technology programs are the key to get into uh, in, in, into the real construction space programs. It is a, really a gateway to, uh, for industry to get involved in uh, in space programs. Also to be um, in Emits and to have uh, access to all of the opportunities in Emits is also a, um, a key aspect. And I also would like to remember everyone in the audience that uh, formerly ISA don't have um, ILOs. The ILOs of ISA are the national representatives in the industrial policy committee at ISA. So if you want something uh, nationally or support or whatever, you have to contact uh, those uh, those persons that are available, uh, their contact points on the ISA web. Thank you, Frank. Now we will see if we have uh, some questions from the audience, Belen. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Frank. Uh, so far, no questions uh, for you. It seems that um, it has been very clear. Uh, maybe I have one question for you. ISA is one of the few big science organizations uh, implementing special measures for SMEs. Uh, in fact, uh, I think you have a, a kind of uh, agency uh, SME office. Which yes. is your experience uh, working with these uh, SMEs? It's, uh, it's very good. I think we have, um, uh, we have indeed a de dedicated and very professional SME office with mm -hmm. some uh, liaison in different countries. Uh, also, we have some association of SME for space, which is regrouping a certain number of, uh, of SMEs. Uh, you have a dedicated one in Germany also. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we have both dedicated activities that are done by, the, by this office. And I think it can be presented at another webinar. I think it was planned to be done. But also, there are some industrial policy measures for SME. If I take an example, uh, there was at the, the very large procurement we did for Copernicus, but also for a large exploration uh, mission that we have done the last month, a dedicated requirement to have a minimum share of uh, 5% in some cases or 10%, and this represents tens of millions dedicated mm -hmm. to SMEs. Okay. Now, I must add that you have, you know, you have SMEs that have been working for space for a while and they can do flight hardware uh, because you need special facilities. I mean, of course, in big science, you have a lot of, let's say, technical challenge with a lot of similarities in terms of uh, mm -hmm. clean room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there is also a lot of opportunities in software development, in business application, where you do not need all this investment upfront. And SMEs that want to work in this area, they should really look into the example I mentioned on the, the downstream area, uh, uh, so via OSIP or via the Navi Spin Cube or the different programs. This is where it's important to go through the different presentation of the industrial space days, where you will better find where you would be mm -hmm. able to, to fit. 
Okay, thank you very much uh, for your answer. Uh, we have received uh, one question for you. Can you give uh, some more details on ISA technology transfer program? Um, well, it's difficult to do that in a few minutes. I think we have it yeah. foreseen. Uh, we have foreseen a dedicated webinar. Huh? Normally, I think Rob yes. was mentioning that for February. Um, this is, uh, let's say, if you want to know a bit more there, it's you should go to um, the what the business application and space solution uh, program. This is where you will find most of the activities which foresee a technology transfer from space technology into, um, let's say, some space technology into uh, ground application. And there is a dedicated presentation that was done by my colleague, Aude de Klerk, in the Industrial Space Days. So there you will have all the details, uh, okay. which is uh, for, by someone much more qualified and with uh, a bit more time that work we can have now to, to present. Okay, thank you for, for your answer. Um, no more questions. So thank you very much uh, for being here today. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank, uh, for all the for the presentation and also for giving the opportunity to uh, to uh, to all the audience to uh, to uh, get more information with the link of the industrial days that you will perform uh, in September and um, and um, and also to show how to enter into Evit's uh, web portal. Thank you very much, Frank. You're welcome. Your Okay, uh, our next speaker um, is, is uh, coming from uh, ESO, um, 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 uh, the European Southern Observatory. Uh, Roberto Tamay is, uh, is with us. Um, Roberto, thank you very much for your, your availability and presentation and uh, go ahead, the floor is yours. Okay, I hope you can uh, see the video and I hope you can also hear myself. I'm trying also to we we can see the presentation, but uh, we hear you a little bit far away. Is that any better? Much better. Thank you very much, Roberto. Okay, so I will drive you today towards the uh, facilities that uh, we are building, hoping also to trigger your enthusiasm and your interest in participating in this uh, endeavor and adventure. First of all, let's start with uh, the organization that I'm working for, this is the agenda. I will briefly introduce what is the European Southern Observatory. And then why do we build this extremely large telescope? What it is that one, the current status, and if we have time, few words about the procurements that will happen uh, in, the, in the next uh, months and years. ISO is an intergovernmental organization whose convention was in the 1962. It started with five countries. Today, there are 16, you see here the flags, with an annual budget that is around 200 million euro. What is our mission? Our mission is to build, operate, world-class ground-based facility to study astronomy. We also foster collaboration. We enable discoveries, scientific discoveries, and all of that uh, aiming to understand better our universe. We also develop new technologies in collaboration with industries. We complement other ground and space facilities. So there is a big synergy about all the ground and space facilities. And all of that in collaboration with scientists, institutes, and industry. I would like to underline that ESO is not only an agency. We do really operate facility. We build the facility together with industry. It is ESO people who operate the telescope in Chile and the other one. So here you see our portfolio of facilities. Everything started in, uh, in the 60s with uh, La Silla that is still there. There are still a fantastic exoplanet hunting telescope there. Then we have Paranal with, uh, that is one of the uh, most efficient observatory uh, in ground today. We have ALMA, there are 66 radio antenna and there is Apex that was a prototype of ALMA. We are now, going to be part of the Cherenkov uh, uh, telescope array that is uh, still in the design phase in the uh, future approval of that one. But today we will focus our attention to the extremely large telescope. Why do we are in Chile? In Chile because it's one of the best places on ground to observe the sky. There are extremely dry conditions. 90% of the time the sky is clean. 
very low turbulence. The picture that you see here is taken from the International Space uh, uh, Station. And you see that the clouds are kept below for an inversion layer situation that is created between the coast and the inland. So this is the location of Paraná, where also the ELP is being built. And this is Alma at 5,000 meter high. And you see here the difference with naked eye of seeing a star from Chile in the Nepur site. And obviously, there is also an excellent vision of the southern hemisphere that in the 60s, this was, there were very few telescopes available in the southern hemisphere to look at the southern hemisphere. But why do we build it? Just to trigger your emotion. This is our galaxy. This is the location of the Earth. You see, we are something like 26,000 year distance from the uh, black hole of our galaxy. You have seen that recently. Uh, two days ago, it was announced that the Nobel Prize uh, of um, uh, Rainer Genzel, who has won that using the ESO facility in order to understand a little bit better the situation of the black hole at the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. But uh, in this picture, there are 5,000 5, galaxies similar to our one. And this picture, that is the extreme deep field uh, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, is only this little part of our sky. And in this little part of our sky, there are 5,000 uh, galaxies similar to our one. So I'm sure you get lost absolutely when you start thinking how little we are and why do we need these kind of facilities to better understand our universe. A little bit of what are the capability, what will be the capability of the extremely large telescope. This is today our universe, the Big Bang. We are at 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang. And with this facility, we will be capable to go down here after 300 million from the Big Bang. That is when all the first stars, the first galaxy start to fall. And that's one of the main reasons to understand how all of that started, how all of these uh, stars and constellations start forming. So with this telescope, we should be able, we will be able to go down here and understand better our universe. This is because the ELP excels in collective power. It's a big primary mirror that is the collector of light, collector of photons, and a credible high angular resolution. It is five times better than actual um, uh, BETS telescope and 5,000 faster exposure time. So there will be completely new parameters. It's like opening a window that uh, you go in an hotel at night, the day after you open the window and you see a panorama that you didn't expect it would have been there. Just to give an idea of comparing the capability. This is a, a fixed, for a fixed field of view, this is the capability of the Hubble Space Telescope that is above our atmosphere. That is the, one of the main reasons that uh, it is difficult to build telescope on ground because of the disturbances introduced by the atmosphere. This is the same field of view with actual best adaptive optic telescope at Paraná. Adaptive optics is the technique that remove the noise introduced by our atmosphere. And this is what we will achieve with the ELT. So you can see the increased resolution that we will obtain with this facility. I was speaking about the atmosphere because indeed, it is fantastic to see it. it is this thin layer as it appears from the space, but at the same time, it disturbs the light that is going, reaching our ground. You see here an image of uh, the sky without the removal of all of this atmosphere noise. And this is one we, when we close the loop with this adaptive technology, that is a, a technology that changes the shapes in real time uh, of one of the mirror at the level of kilohertz being uh, uh, corrected monitoring a reference guide star. And therefore we remove all the disturbances that the atmosphere is transferring to the light that is crossing up. So after all of this part, what are the questions that the scientists have? How our planetary system form, how common the systems are, and obviously, obviously do other planets have atmospheres? Are there exoplanets like our Earth? And can we detect any signals? Like these are only few of the questions that we all have, and we would like to provide an answer. We will be capable with this telescope or identify exoplanets in an habitable zone. But most importantly, we will be able to analyze the atmosphere 
of exoplanet. This will be the first telescope who will be capable of detecting biomark in the atmosphere of exoplanet similar to the Earth once they've been identified in the habitable zone. Now, after all of this one, time is running, what is the ELT? Just to give you a feeling of the size of the telescope, I put it in the Colosseum with the hope that you are all familiar with that one, and that's the size of the telescope. And this one has to fit into a dome, into a house, and you see the, the house will be as big as a football uh, uh, soccer field, and this is the actual design that has to open with a huge door, and that's the telescope. How does it work? It's a pretty complex system in order to remove all of this noise introduced both by the telescope itself and by the external, such as the wind, the atmosphere, the gravity, thermal deformation, and so on. So there is the primary mirror that you see here. Its diameter is 39 meters. This one is composed by 798 segments, each of them 1.5 meter diameter. There are 798 that have to be kept in position at the nanometric uh, uh, position from each other. The light collected that is coming from the sky is reflected to the secondary, that is a four meter convex mirror. It's a jewel, never ever produce such that one. The light from the secondary is reflected to the tertiary. Down here is another four meter mirror. Then it goes to M4 and M5, that are two adaptive optics mirror. This is very thin, the M4, 1.9 millimeter thin, that is continuously changed in shape to follow the disturbances introduced mirrored from the atmosphere. It then goes to the M5 to finally go the light on the focus. And here is where it is analyzed by the various scientific instruments. In case I was not uh, clear enough, uh, in this picture you see what is the path of the lights from the primary to the secondary up here. It then goes to the tertiary. And then M4, that is a very thin mirror, to the fifth, and then here, on the platform where there will be all the scientific instruments to analyze, to detect, to acquire the lights collected by the telescope. And in this picture, you see what are the first scientific instruments. This is the light that is coming from the telescope here. We do have Mikado, that is the adaptive optics imaging camera. So it will take image with the lights further corrected by Maori. That is a further improvement adaptive optics unit. Then we have Harmony here, that is an integral field spectrograph operating over a large wavelength length. And finally, METIS, that is the mid-infrared imager. So we take, we cover several uh, wavelengths, and METIS will be an imager and spectrograph in the infrared field. Now, where are we going to build it? We are still in the Atacama Desert. This is where the uh, Paranal here is and built and full operation. The ELT is at Cerro Armazones, 25 kilometers inland from Paraná. And in this picture, it's interesting to note the distance from where we are taking the picture, that is an airplane, to here, Yuyayaco Mountain. Yuyayaco is at 200 kilometer distance from Paraná. And you see how clear is the sky. What is the current construction status? In these uh, uh, slides that you will analyze once you have the printed, there are all the contracts and the company who have won previous uh, public bid. So you can here knock the door of this company in case you can supply some be as a subcontractor. Today, there are 32 running contracts, including the agreement with the institution. Six have already been closed or run in a warranty period. The total cost is, uh, the total budget is around 1,200 million euro, including manpower, instruments, and the contingency. We do have in the budget also the operational cost that will be around 50 million euro per year. Today in 2020, we have already placed the contract for more than 95% of the budget in material cost. So we are in an advanced status of its construction. And you see here what is the commitment evolution of, of all the budget. And here is the number of contracts that are still pending. There are very few in the range of uh, uh, two more for this year and five for next year that I will spend a few words about that one. The status, that's the foundation status at Cerro Amazones. Unfortunately, today is closed due to 
pandemic event, what we look forward for its reopening. We were at the point of installing the uh, dampers for the seismic uh, events, because unfortunately Atacama Desert is a very, very seismic area. There are several pieces of the book of the main structure that have been tested in Europe, but also delivered. The contract here has been won by a consortium of Ace, Astaldi and Cimolai. Today, the leader is Cimolai, and you see here several pieces. The cladding test, and this is a test of the cladding done a couple of weeks ago. They are even testing all the tools for the installation of the boobies operation and so on. Also the optics, all these are the M1 blanks and they start with the uh, cylinder one and then becomes hexagonal. This uh, contract has been uh, won by Schott, German company. We are also progressing with the delivery of this item to the polisher. Each segment has to be hosted by a segment support, a very complex item where the um, uh, glass will be located. The contract of this has been won by BDL in the Netherlands. And here is when we are delivering the first item to the polisher in uh, Poitiers. And here is the production company for the assembling of the glass on the segment support, the polishing, finishing for the final delivery to Chile. What it is needed is, of course, to position all of that. And we have uh, position actuators, a contract won by Physic Instrumentals in Germany. And these are the edge sensors by a consortium of Fogal and Micro Epsilon. These are the detector of the position from each other of the segment. They can, uh, um, they can measure the speed of growing of the grass uh, in your house, uh, just to give you an idea of the sensibility of these tools. And you see that we are recently going to start uh, the serious uh, construction of this sensor and this actuator. This is the M2. I was speaking about this at the beginning. This is the one that goes on top. This is one we have delivered the blank to the polisher in um, Saint Pierre du Perret in France. And this is the product, uh, progression on the polishing of this mirror. We do have also contract for the cell where the mirror will be hosted. And this has been won by Sener in Spain. There is progress on the testing of the hexapod. And this is the interface between the telescope and the instrument, the pre-focal station that will be used also to point and track the telescope before we deliver the light to the instrument. This is the one of the six shells of the M4. This is the uh, thin mirror that I was mentioning for the adaptive optics techniques with all the actuators that have been manufactured in Italy by Adoptica, a consortium of uh, ADS and Microgate in Italy. Last mirror is the M5. We have recently placed the contract for the cell with Sener. And for the mirror, it's a very complex item in silicon carbide that has been won by Ustep and Reus. Last slide related to the uh, schedule, actually. Today, the first slide before COVID impact was planned for the end of 2025. We are still implementing what are the various delays implemented by the various contracts. COVID is still there. The site, unfortunately, is still closed. So unfortunately, don't be a surprise if soon you will see that the ELP has been delayed by several months, unfortunately, for all of that. Few words on the procurements. I really want to run and then if in case- Roberto, you, you have one minute left, okay, go ahead. We are going to procure the cameras for these, uh, um, uh, for the LDSM that is a complex uh, detector for the adaptive optics. We are going, and I'm also indicating here the slide for potential subcontractor of these cameras. We have launched now a preliminary inquiry for a tracing gun to measure the position of the segment from each other. Technology developed in-house that will be procured from the industry. And finally, we will have to procure also some metrology tools for the alignment system of the optics on the telescope. And here we are also indicating what are the uh, timeline of each of these, uh, of each of these uh, procurements. Last real-time uh, real control infrastructure is going to be launched hopefully by the first quarter of next year with uh, here indicated what are the characteristics of the industry that can apply to that. Last one is uh, at these web pages, you can enter, you go on the business at ISO and you will be uh, linked to this web page where you can have access to all the forthcoming calls for tender to the process what are the ELP procurements that we go and uh, are going to be done. So I really invite you to look at this web page and to conclude, for me, it is like building an highway, an autopista, 
towards a better understanding of our universe and to increase the know-how of the entire mankind. So thank you very much. And sorry if I went a little bit uh, below um, above the time. I really hope to have excited and more triggered your interest to join this fantastic adventure. Thank you, Jorge. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Roberto. Um, you, you really trigger out uh, your excitement about the universe. Thank you very much. And also the, the in extremely interest uh, of the ES, um, ESTS uh, telescope that you are uh, now constructing. It's a, it's, it's a great effort uh, up to the limit of, of, te uh, of technology. We will see if we have some uh, questions from, uh, from the audience, uh, Belen. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Roberto. No questions for you, just uh, congratulations for your presentation. So maybe I, I have a question. Uh, how can SME participate in a small project in collaboration with ISO? For instance, instrumentations, uh, prototypes? Okay, thank you for your uh, question. There are two ways. First, uh, in the web page that you see here, I think it's still, uh, it's still there, if you enter in the various forthcoming codes for tender or procurement, you can apply and you can mod indicate your interest to participate to those calls for tender or entering in the ELT web pages, you can verify who are the companies and the institutions that are building the scientific instruments. There you can follow the link and understand how to knock the door at these people and say, look, I can offer you know-how in real-time computing, in mm -hmm. these kind of actuators, in the optics, and so on. That's why I have indicated that link, those indications that might be helpful to the various people who show interest. OK, uh, we have received uh, one question. Are there components where vacuum uh, required? For instance, cameras, yes, you have mentioned. Yes, there are interest for uh, um, vacuum. We are now running a, comp a, a call for tender for a coater. A coater is a unit to deposit the reflective material on the top of the glass. In mm -hmm. order to do that, we have to go in high vacuum condition and therefore providing an expert in a big tank, we are speaking about five meter diameter tank of height of around two meters, will be very much appreciated. So this is a running call for tender, where again, at the link that I've shown, people can see what I was speaking, what I'm speaking about, and most demonstrate their interest to participate. Okay, another more, another more question. Uh, having ELT procurement mostly done, what future large projects might be for ESO and in what timeline? That's an interesting question. Um, today, timeline goes uh, for the end of the 20s. I speak about uh, 2029, 2030, where there could be um, ideas for new projects. New projects are still there. Our friend scientists are always pushing and asking for something more than what the engineering are trying to provide them. So uh, the timeline is by the end of these decades, beginning of next one for a big project. But in terms mm -hmm. of little projects, new instruments, that is always alive. There is always a request. For example, we are already speaking about the second generation of instruments for the ELT. We are speaking about okay. Mosaic and Hi-Res. And that will happen. Again, go to the web pages of ESO and you will see what is the roadmap of the instrument and of the future, uh, future project. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your answer and for your participation, Roberto. No more questions. Thank you very much, Roberto, for your answers and for your excitement um, about um, about um, um, our universe and, and the ways to reach them. Okay, thank you very much. Our next speaker uh, is also related to um, to um, astronomy. Is uh, Miguel Nunez from the EST? Um, and, 
uh, European Solar Telescope. Um, and Miguel, uh, thank you very much for being uh, with us. Uh, you should really know that EST is one of the new uh, associated big science organizations uh, invited for this um, big science business forum in 2021. And we are really happy to have EST with us. Miguel, go ahead, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, good morning. Well, let me start uh, saying uh, thank you very much for inviting us to uh, Big Science Business Forum. My name is Miguel Luna from the I am from the Institute of Astrophysics in the Canaries. I am the system engineer of the European Solar Telescope. Today, I'm going to describe briefly the EST, and I will also show you the tenders that we plan to publish in 2021. EST is a solar telescope with a 4.2 meters primary emitter that will be the biggest solar telescope in Europe. EST will allow European solar researchers to study the magnetic coupling along the different layers of the solar atmosphere. This better knowledge of the sun will allow to update the models of every other solar like stars. And this learning will also help to predict solar activity variability, such as the solar storms, which may have a big impact on human satellites and also on the health of astronauts. Its big primary mirror, uh, an innovative multi-conjugated adapted optics, will allow EST to have super spatial resolution in a wide field of view. It is being designed, it is being designed to allow very accurate measurements of the polarization of the light coming from the sun because it contains very valuable information about the magnetic fields produced in the sun atmosphere. At the end of VST optical path, there will be 10 instruments for the first generation suite of instruments. I will talk about them uh, in, a, in later slides. The European uh, Association for Solar Telescopes, EAST, is the entity promoting EST and it is currently composed by 26 research institutions from 18 European countries. Uh, this is uh, most of the European countries are, are involved in this association. And I think uh, it's worth mentioning that EST became an S3 strategic European infrastructure in March uh, 2016. Being EAST in association with so many research institutions, you may wonder how do we organize? Okay, EST has a project office in charge of defining the global architecture of the telescope so that it fulfills the science requirements. Once we have a global concept, we split the parts, write the specifications, contract the industry to design the parts on the telescope with more detail, and later we, uh, we build EST. The EST partners can contribute in two different ways, with cash or with in-kind contributions. A very clear example of in-kind contributions are the 10 first-generation instruments that are created by a consortium led by research institutions. In terms of scheduling, uh, we already did a design study in the past. It already finished. And currently, we are addressing the preliminary design, while the detailed design and construction phase will start in 2023 and 2024 respectively, as it can be seen in this slide. The green bars uh, represent where we are now, carrying out the preliminary design, while the blue bars uh, already represent the detailed design, construction, and operation. The head of the bars represents the expected cost. So it is clear that the biggest expenses will, will be during the construction have been a global cost for preparatory phase and construction of 200 million euros. Um, where do we plan to build uh, the European Solar Telescope? EST will be located in the Canary Islands. And although it has not been definitely decided yet in which of the two Canary and observatories, the present proposal is to build the EST in the Observatorio del Roque de los Muchachos in La Palma Island. The definitive decision will be taken soon, maybe at the end of this year, beginning of next one. 
in the picture, in the picture, uh, you can see an artistic recreation where we have added the EST representation over a real picture of the observatory. Uh, now, <clears throat> I'm going to show you uh, the EST optical path. This is an animation which I, I guess you, you will be able to see correctly. The light coming from the sun is reflected in the primary mirror and directed to the adaptive secondary mirror going through the heat reactor that has the optical functionality of, of a fill stop. Then the light is reflected back again, passing by the center of the primary mirror up to a set of four the formal mirrors that will guide the light through a long vacuum chamber to the instrument room where we split the light in different wavelengths and finally deliver it to the scientific instruments. One thing that makes a solar telescope like this one different to nighttime telescopes is that uh, the regular way of operation is using several instruments at the same time. I've mentioned that there will be uh, five deformable mirrors, the adaptive secondary mirror, and also M3, M4, M5, and M6. With all these mirrors, EST will implement a multi-conjugated adapted optics, very ambitious, that will correct the image blur by the Earth atmosphere in a field of view of 40 by 40 seconds and in the visible wavelength. This is quite ambitious also because the atmosphere turbulence are more demanding at daytime than at night time. Um, before talking about the future procurements, I will briefly describe that the 10 instruments that are being designed or foreseen for the first generation suite of instruments are composed by four integral field units, three tunable band imagers, and three fixed band imagers. All of them will be designed and manufactured by a consortium led by research institutions. The integral field units, just to, to give you uh, a definition, measure the spectrum of different parts of an image of the solar atmosphere. All of them, all, all of the parts uh, in which the image has been divided at the same time, increasing science productivity. EST will have three integral field units, two, two of them based on micro lens arrays and one more based on image slicers. Um, the three tunable band imagers are based on fabric perot filters that can scan wavelengths step by step. Let me uh, push the play button. In the slide, we have uh, an animation of a solar spot seen in the continuum and also is Stokes parameters so that we can study its polarization, which I have previously mentioned is quite important to. Uh, to get the information from the uh, magnetism activity in the solar surface. For, um, the third type of instruments are fixed band imagers that are used. Again, I have to play the, the, the uh, I have to push the play button. This, this uh, third type of instrument are fixed band imagers and they are used for contest images as the one that we have here which was taken recently by the, the KISS solar telescope. Normally, we think on solar telescopes, when we think on solar telescopes, we, our imagination or our reminds tends to take us to this kind of videos, which are really uh, beautiful from my point of view. <laughs> but sometimes there are more science to, to produce in the, in the previous instruments. At the end, in, uh, in EST, um, several instruments will work at the same time, as I said before. So uh, finally, I'm going to talk about the present, present tenders and the tenders that we plan to publish in 2021. Let me start saying that our procurement rules are currently according to Spanish regulation. The legal information will be in Spanish, while the specification and a statement of work will be in English. You can send us an email simply with your company information indicating what tender uh, you're interested on. You can also stay tuned to our web page where we uh, 
publish the future call for tenders and we also uh, announce the, the day that they are, uh, once they are published, uh, we announce them also on the web page. Additionally, when we publish a new tender, we communicate it to our uh, ILO so that companies uh, subscribe to CDTI news will be notified also. And we uh, uh, kindly ask the, the ILO to communicate it to rest of ESO ILOs from other countries. I want to highlight that all the tenders I will talk about in the following slides are for designing. We do not have tenders for EST construction yet, at least not uh, next year. They will come in 2023 and 2024, most of them. The first tender is for, uh, there is uh, the one we have in the slide, is for the primary mirror, adaptive secondary mirror, structure, pier, and dome preliminary design. And it had a budget of about near 2 million euros. This tender is already in evaluation phase. And maybe some of the companies participating in this tender, uh, maybe they are attending this webinar. So let me say that the evaluation is almost complete and will be published soon. Now let's go for the first future call for tender. These are the ones, the first one in the list for uh, the ones we, we plan to publish in 2021. Um, the, the, this one is a preliminary design of a heat reactor, which I mentioned previously, and it is expected to be published in the first quarter of uh, next year with an expected, expected price of about 200,000 euros. This involves mainly mechanical design, thermal analysis, analysis finite element uh, modeling, and cooling systems. And uh, this scope uh, has not been uh, fully closed yet, but we plan to uh, to put a bit of optical design also in the scope of this uh, uh, tender, although it would be mostly uh, mechanical and thermal, as I said before. Okay, now I will mention two tenders that require the optomechanical design of two parts of a telescope. They are the transfer optics and polarimetric calibration assemblies and the optics path along the pier, which includes a vacuum chamber, a long vacuum chamber, and the supports for the optical elements. The optical design up to the conceptual level is carried out by the EST project office. And then we will publish the standard for the optomechanics preliminary design to compare different options and to optimize the design. So it would be uh, mostly uh, dedicated to optomechanics uh, technology. Also with some, uh, with knowledges of uh, thermal analysis. The thermal analysis are present in, in most of the design, in the design of most of, most of the parts of uh, EST. The expected publishing date is the last quarter of 2021, and you can see the expected price in the slides, in this, in this slide. Okay, let's move on. This standard is for the design of the building, the civil works and the facilities, but only up to the preliminary level of definition with the purpose of verifying the civility of the construction from different points of view architectural, geological, environmental, and economical. This uh, could be split in, in, in two uh, small uh, minor contracts, so it's perfectly accessible to SMEs. And the last one that I'm going to announce today is again the main building, auxiliary building, facilities, and civil works, but this time at execution level. This can be later divided into parts. We have not decided this yet. The first part dedicated to produce the documentation to apply for the construction license, and the second part dedicated to the execution project that can later be used for the procurement of the construction. Currently, this standard is estimated uh, in about uh, 650,000 euros. But this amount can still be modified depending on the final scope that, that will be decided during the first half of 2021. 
Okay, this is the acknowledgement to the countries and agencies funding this phase of the project. And uh, my last slide uh, is just to say you all thank you, the attendees and the BSBF uh, organization, uh, where you can find my personal contact and the, our web page for procurements, our web page uh, in, for general information about the telescope and also the uh, email contacts for the general and the one for ongoing call for tenders. This is differentiated because once we get closer to the uh, publishing of call for tenders, we uh, cannot have direct contacts with the companies because it would imply discrimination if we talk with someone and we don't talk with some, some other one. And, okay. In order to avoid this uh, and give uh, equal opportunities to uh, uh, to every companies, once we're getting close to the publishing of a call for tender, the uh, contacts is using this email that I have right in the middle, contratacion at iac.s. So this is all from my side. Thank you very much and thank you for your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel. Um, thank you for, for your um, presentation. It's, it's really exciting. You are now in the in the um, in the preparatory phase, um, in the preliminary de design phase, uh, with uh, 13 million euros, and then uh, uh, after 2022, 2023, you will start the execution with 185 million euros. This is a, a lot of uh, activity, and uh, thank you very much for sharing with us uh, all the opportunities that. Um, a European solar telescope is put in, in place for, uh, for, uh, for industry. Now we will see if we have some questions from the audience. Belen? Yes. yes, thank you, Miguel. So far, one question received uh, for you. The peer optics path uh, is the one that uh, will be published at around uh, 120 kilo euros. Is that right? Yes. As you can see here, the first one, the transfer optics and polarimetric calibration will be the 250 kilo euros, while the pure optics path would be around 120 kilo euros. It's supposed to be a much simpler uh, design, while the first one has more elements, is where the four deformable mirrors have to be supported. This does not include the selection of the deformable mirrors, but just the, the mechanical support. So we are doing an optical design where every optical elements are in order for us to understand uh, in the air, okay? Mm -hmm. So this uh, this procurement is for the design of all the mechanical mechanical parts to support it all, and it is not just mechanical but opto mechanics, which uh, well is a sub speciality of mechanical design. But yes, peer optics is the small one, let's say, and transfer optics and polarimetric calibration is the a bit bigger one. Anyway, these prices are not fixed yet. It can be uh, slightly modified. Okay. Thank you for your clarification. Um, no more questions. Uh, maybe I have one for you. Uh, very briefly, um, could you explain the audience which are your standard types of procurement process? I mean, do you normally use pro open procedures, uh, restricted procedures? Well, the ones that we've been using so far are open procedures. Okay. Uh, and when the we we're not uh, red funds of. Uh, of uh, call for tender. So if the amount of money is not uh, big enough, we just do minor minor contracts, mm -hmm. which imply getting different offers and doing a comparison, uh, mostly based on price, but also in other considerations, maybe as well use. Uh, they are more, uh, they're faster to, 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 to communicate to the companies and faster to decide. But the call for tenders uh, regarding your question, we have published so far, they are open. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, no more questions. So uh, I give the floor now to, to Jorge. Thank you very much for your Thank you, Miguel. questions. Okay. Thank, thank you, Miguel. And um, uh, indeed, it's, it, it, it's a, it was an extremely interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, 
seeing the European Solar Telescope, how you are implementing it. And, and it is also worth uh, to mention that uh, you are one of the S3 projects uh, and now on. Okay. Now we are going to, um, to uh, jump a little bit in our agenda because um, um, and now we are going to, um, to have the presentation of Mirra. Um, Mirra is uh, the new uh, associate um, um, big science or, uh, organization for the BSBF. Um, and with us, uh, we have uh, Mr. Hamid uh, at uh, the Ramhim. Um, and, and he's with us uh, to show which are the um, strategic plans, the procurements and the flagship projects and how uh, you are going to implement uh, this facility in Belgium. Uh, Professor Hamid, uh, the floor is yours. Go ahead, thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jorge. So good morning, everybody. And uh, it's my pleasure presenting in this uh, BSBF webinar where we are with Mira and what are the plans for spending in the coming four years. So I will try to tell you in few words what is uh, the Mira project and uh, the reasons to invest in such a project in uh, Europe and uh, particularly why Belgium is so interested in it. And um, the phase one realization and the procurement that we are foreseeing uh in this for the period 2024 so mira is what we call uh, in our jargon accelerator driven system uh it's coupling a subcritical reactor that's this box where where are the uh, let me see if i can find the pointer laser oh, uh, I don't, I'll not make mistakes. So you see my uh, mouse moving yes. the cursor? Okay, this is the reactor, subcritical reactor, which has a power of 65 to 100 megawatt thermal. When we say subcritical, this number in a classical reactor is equal to one. When it's smaller than one, this means it doesn't contain enough fissile material to, uh, I would say, uh, sustain the chain reaction. And therefore you need to couple to it an accelerator that brings protons from your accelerator to the center and creates what we call a spallation neutron target in the center. Our target will create two 10 to the 17 neutron per second by shooting protons of 600 MeV energy in a continuous wave with an intensity up to 4 milliamps current in continuous wave that generates 10 to the 17 neutron per second in the center of the core. And these protons are bombarding continuously the liquid metal, which is a mixture of lead and bismuth eutectic and it's melting at 123 degrees C. And this uh, coupling of the three element is uh, what we call the concept of ADS and the purpose of this machine is to make research in different fields. I will explain to you, but the main topic of research we would like to do is to solve the issue of the nuclear waste that are generated in our power reactors of today and can be uh, going in the geological disposal. But if you reduce some kind of waste, you can reduce the time span of these uh, uh, nuclear waste. So the MIRA portfolio research is, uh, MIRA stands for multi-purpose hybrid research reactor for high-tech applications and the kind of high-tech applications uh, is to make material for fusion reactors, to research that. Fundamental research, thanks to the accelerator for medical radioisotope, fundamental uh, science, material science, etc. We can use also the neutrons we are generating in the reactor for looking to 
future generation four kind of reactors that will be allowing more sustainability for nuclear energy. We do look for producing medical radioisotope for innovative radioisotope for medical applications. We do also uh, demonstration for what we call small modular reactors, but we can do demonstrations of them. You see here the ideas to get to a reactor that can be transported on a lorry from the production plant to uh, the place where it has to be plugged and uh, producing electricity or heat or uh, hydrogen. It's not just making electricity. But as I said, the main purpose of research is to deal with the spent nuclear fuel getting out from our today's reactors. And today, sorry, today, when you are using natural uranium that you are turning into fuel that goes in your today's reactors, PWR or BWR reactors that are the major kind of reactor we have worldwide, we are having close to 480 reactors. Sometimes we, when you are in Europe, you hear only that we are, we have to shut down nuclear energy. Even my country is saying that we can get rid of our nuclear power by 2025, whereas it represents 50% of our electricity. So I don't know how we will be doing then. Um, also answering our duties towards CO2 reduction. We want to change all our cars to electric cars by 2026, at least the one that the companies are uh, providing to their personnel. But we suppress at the same time the nuclear electricity, which represent 50%. So I think some of our politicians either are uh, magicians or not knowing what they are talking about. But that's the reality of our world. We have to cope with that. But nevertheless, the uh, nuclear waste is on our table. We continue nuclear energy or we stop nuclear energy. The waste is on the table. Then what you can do with that today, you are increasing the radiotoxicity of the uranium ore you use by a factor thousand when you put that nu uh, nuclear fuel in the uh, nuclear power plant you produce during four year and a half electricity with that and also one of the fashion thing that we love to say uh, in terms of um, uh, production when you speak about a nuclear power plant you say it's 1000 megawatt electric and when you build 10 windmills you say it will be producing electricity for 25,000 families then you are not telling the same, not using the same units for different sources of energy, which is also a communication problem for the large public. Today, we have to know that we, if we are going to windmills and to solar energy, this is great because it's not producing CO2, but we have to pay the price of that non-concentrated electricity. It's a reality. And that reality is not spoken by politicians to the poor guys that will be not be capable to pay their electricity anymore. But so I say you have to climb here and to bring the radiotoxicity to the level initial one, if you just bury the, the, this spent nuclear fuel and you consider it as a nuclear waste without reprocessing, you need 300,000 years to get back there. If you do the classical reprocessing, it means that you retrieve the uranium and the plutonium you created in that fuel, and you go to bury vitrified nuclear waste containing the minor actinide and the fission product, because in nuclear reactor, what you are doing is using the formula of Einstein, E equal MC square, to create the energy. So part of your energy uh, is coming by transforming a, a tiny quantity into energy. And that's what is uh, the interesting aspect of fission. With very small quantities, you can get large amount uh, of energy. 
if I would replace a nuclear power plant of 1000 megawatt electric by coal fired plant, what we do today when we close our uh, nuclear power plants, instead of burning 800 grams for one year in that nuclear power plant, turning uranium into energy, I should burn 1.6 million tons of carbon of coal in a nuclear in a, a coal-fired plant to do the same quantity of energy. This is just to fix the ideas to the people who are listening. Okay, so I reprocess, I get out the uranium and plutonium, I recycle, and I get to 10,000 years what remains. But if I take 2.5 kilogram per ton of used fuel, which has the minor actinine, I drop this issue to 300 years. So that's the kind of research we would like to do thanks to developing the MIRA. Now, the reasons to invest. MIRA is on S3 since 2010. And yesterday we were undergoing an examination once again with our colleagues of the S3 evaluators to see whether MIRA can become a landmark uh, in the next uh, evaluation that will be published by uh, 21, actually March, I think. We are also in the integrated set plan of the energy independence of Europe. And we hope that uh, this idea of Green Deal will not take out the nuclear energy because we think uh, a combination of renewable with nuclear will be the right and rational solution for Europe and for keeping its independence and meeting the CO2 very challenging objective that we have put for our society uh, in this. The good thing is that Belgium is very convinced in investing in this because it responds to its strategic objective. Mira is taken in the national plan, integrated plan for energy and climate. It is also present in uh, the uh, national pact for invest strategic investments for the energy part of this uh, national pact. And also for this issue of the nuclear waste, because uh, as I said, Belgium is uh, in its uh, last declaration of the government is willing to confirming that if we can, we will stop the nuclear power plant by 25. Nevertheless, as I said, the waste is on the table and the solution of the transmutation of the nuclear waste is considered in this study, which is public. You can go to the website of the federal government, the economic affairs, and you download it for uh, looking that if you are interested. Unfortunately, it's not in English. It's either in French or Dutch uh, available on the website. But also what our country is saying that we are willing to maintain a high level of expertise in nuclear know-how. And we know that it's not by reading books or uh, lecturing at the university uh, that you can maintain a very high level of expertise. Today, the turnover of, uh, let's say, nuclear-related activities in the country yearly turnover is 6 billion euro, 22,000 people working in this field, not only for nuclear energy, but nuclear medicine, nuclear uh, space. We, are, we just hear, heard about space before. We are very present also in the space applications and also for... Um, radiation protection, protecting environment and people from radiation. So uh, Belgium is very active in uh, various fields of, uh, so where nuclear know-how is used. And so we want to maintain that. We want not only to maintain, but uh, uh, remain and be an inter international attraction pole for your young talented people in nuclear applications. And we are experiencing with MIRA 
uh, this happening. We have uh, 34 nationalities in the project today and turn innovation into solution for society challenges like the nuclear waste, nuclear medicine, and nuclear sustainability of the energy. Today, we have a large international uh, partnership in various uh, sectors uh, from the universities. We have many European universities working with us, research centra uh, present with us in the MIRA project, and also the private sector and companies involved. Beyond Europe, we have uh, relations with uh, South Korea, Japan, DOE, some others which are less uh, really present with us. Now, when it comes to what are we spending today, uh, we, our money is mainly Belgian money, but we have some uh, European money coming from some projects. But the big money is coming from Belgium. I will, I will tell you what is the amount of money. We are going to construct the first phase of MIRA, what we call Minerva, and I will tell you more detail about that. But, and I will tell you the procurement, the amount of spending, which we are having in 2020 to 24 is about uh, more than 200 million euro to be spent in there. So the decision to build Mira has been taken in 2018 by the federal Belgian government. We opened that for international participation. Therefore, we are listed on S3 to make it a European research, large research infrastructure, but it will be positioned in mall uh, where uh, the labs and the premises of SCKCN are present. It will be in Belgium. This is northeast of Belgium. Uh, the allocated the money in, for the period 2019 to 2038 by the Belgian government is more than half a billion euro. And out of that half a billion, there will be about 300 million, which will be concentrated for the realization of phase one. I will show you what's that. What I mean, contains. Uh, you, you have one, uh, one minute left, okay? Okay, uh, yeah. And uh, the, we have also the consortium of IESBL for that. So what we want to construct is this part, the accelerator 200 MeV supplemented by a proton target facility. And um, then will come the phase two and three after two, 2026. This should be built by 26. The footprint of what we built is this part, so the accelerator 200 MeV, the proton target facility and the auxiliary buildings. So the contracts that are given today are mainly related to this. There is some support R&D uh, contracts, few tens of millions, whereas here we are talking about 200 million. And this is the kind of things that we are doing. Uh, there are design engineers for these parts uh, there are also procurements for the uh, accelerator and procurements mainly for the uh, uh, cavities that we are uh, uh, needing for this uh, accelerator. Also the buildings and the proton target facility, which are this building here. The design engineer contract has been uh, just signed yesterday uh, with the consortium from UK, whereas the accelerator consortium is with Spain and Belgium consortium. The ISOL uh, targets will be based on the Triumph uh, uh, design. And there is a place where you have to look on the website of Mira here, procurement. You will find all the contracts of procurement. And if you don't find just send info at mira.be and we will be responding to you. I have finished. I think there is an animation. I don't know if it will work or not. Yeah, it is working. Yeah. So this is the phase one, this building, the accelerator, the proton target facility, and this is the RF hall, radio frequency hall, then the phase two, 
600 MeV accelerator, and then the phase three, the reactor subcritical reactor building and its reactor its site. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hamid, uh, for your presentation, not only for the procurements and, uh, and for the data uh, that you provide uh, towards industry, also for giving a flavor of uh, uh, the problem we have uh, with us uh, with, uh, in, in, with nuclear waste and uh, the possible solution that could be Mira to deal with. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we will see now if we, I mean, I, I, I retain uh, that you are going to invest uh, around 200 million euros in the time frame 2020-2024. This is a big yeah. message of, of interest to, to all industry. And we will see if we have some uh, questions from the audience. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Hamid. Uh, so far, no questions uh, for you. Maybe I have one. Um, you have been explaining procurement opportunities for phase one. Uh, how do you intend to, to obtain the funds necessary for phases two and three? Are you thinking in in-kind contributions schemes uh, coming from other countries? Yes. So, uh, as I said, we created the, we are creating this uh, international uh, organization, non-profit organization, IESBL for hosting the international consortium. And the contributions that we are opening uh, are either in kind or in cash for the countries that are interested in MIRA. Uh, both are possible. And we have uh, the framework for uh, the contribution and then the positions that will be uh, in the governing board of this IESBL as international body for sure, for regulating the use of that money, which is international. Okay, thank you for your clarification. Uh, there are questions arriving. Uh, first one, uh, can you please confirm uh, with, with which procurements will be posted on the MIRVA website? Well, all what concerns this realization of the accelerator uh, of 100 MeV and the proton target facility components. So means uh, um, accelerator cavities, spoke cavities, supraconducting ones. This mm -hmm. is still open uh, for uh, uh, providing this. This will be in the coming uh, months that we will be putting the contracts, uh, uh, the call for uh, tenders. Also, all what concerns the INC, the instrumentation and control system of the accelerator, as well as of the proton target facility, will be available. The call for tenders will be available in there. And this is also very soon to be launched. These are contracts of many millions euro. Uh, and the, um, the procurement for the raw niobium is already uh, given the design engineer, as I said, for the accelerator building, as well as for the uh, uh, proton target facility building has been uh, uh, awarded based on public tendering. So uh, the procedures for the public tendering are also published on our website uh, for uh, the, the way we are doing that. Okay, uh, we are receiving a lot of questions uh, for you. Okay. <laughs> Next one, what is the, the share between procurement and design activities in the tenders to come? Sorry? This, the share, which part uh, of the next procurement activities will be dedicated to design activities and which part will be dedicated uh, to the construction? Uh, I would say, uh, while well, the design uh, is about uh, 15% of the total uh, of that amount of money. Construction money is uh, more uh, about uh, 80%. Okay, thank you for the clarification. 
Uh, wonderful project. Uh, I understood that the accelerator construction has been already assigned it, uh, to a consortium. Can you be more specific about the, the no. members of the consortium? No, no, the construction of the accelerator is not assigned yet. Okay. We are in the process of looking for the, I would say, uh, the procurement of this accelerator. We what we have assigned is the design engineer for the building uh, preparation, and even the building itself is not yet assigned. This is the design, the cons uh, the uh, design engineering of the the buildings are assigned as well as for the proton target, but for the construction of those buildings is not yet assigned. Will be coming, this will be coming around N21. Okay, perfect. You are now answering the next question that goes about uh, the buildings. Uh, of, yeah, uh, it, this N21 will be the, uh, the call for uh, the... Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I think this is the last a question for you. Are the procurement about uh, switching magnets already being published? Not yet. It will be published uh, in, uh, I would say, beginning of 21. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, yes, there is uh, one more question arriving for you. Uh, Anis, uh, it, it is expected to use components made of beryllium? Uh, no. No. In phase one, not. Maybe in uh, the reactor part. Okay. I think that's all. A lot of questions uh, for you. So no, no more questions. Thank you very much, uh, Hamid. Yeah. And uh, if there are questions, I, I, I am uh, recommending really to look to this uh, uh, web page of Mira about uh, procurement. And also, if there are no clear, just send Mira at SEKCN or info at mira.be. Okay, thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you very much, Hamid, for, uh, for your presentation, for your availability, and uh, for the audience. Uh, um, a search on the on the Mira website and be aware of all the um, uh, procurements uh, to come. Thank you very much. Um, now we are going um, to our next speaker. Um, um, our um, next speaker is going to come um, uh, from uh, SCA organization. Laura Olmos uh, Diaz uh, will make the presentation and I, uh, Ian Hastings will take the, uh, the questions. Um, um, Laura, um, go ahead, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, well, thank you, Jorge. Thank you for having us. We're very pleased to be present at the BSBF webinar. Uh, my name is Laura, I work from, for SKA, and uh, I will be doing the presentation and then my colleague Ian Hastings will be replying to your questions. So I would like to start with a brief outline of, of the presentation. Um, we're, I'm going to present the SKA project to you so you know what we do. And then I will talk a bit about the procurement of 2020 and a bit of the planning of 2021. And we'll finish with some uh, observatory challenges that we have identified that are very important for us at the moment. So um, to talk about the SKA project, we are talking about an international collaboration and partnership to build the world largest radio telescope. Uh, building and delivering this unique instrument represents a significant leap uh, forward in both engineering and research and development areas. Um, our project includes one observatory, two telescopes, and three host countries, that would be the United Kingdom, Australia, and South Africa, that together with the rest of SKA member countries that you can see on the screen, will help us to explore the universe with the world's largest radio telescope. The construction will take place between 2021 and 2028, 
and the estimated cost in 2017 was 691 million euros. Once the telescope is completed, we intend it to be operational for over 50 years. The SK Observatory will be established as an AGO and will undertake the construction operation of the SK telescope. Well, um, our headquarter is located in Jodrebank in the UK. Um, we will be around more than 140 people in full operation period. We are not in these numbers yet. Uh, here are a couple of pictures of the facility on a very beautiful sunny day, which is not that uh, useful. And uh, then the telescopes are going to be located in Australia and South Africa. Australia will be home of SKA-1 low frequency with, with around 130,000 antennas spread across 65 kilometers. And uh, South Africa will host SKA-1 mid and it's 200 dishes across 150 kilometers. The dishes will be at about 15 meters. Um, you can see here a recreation of the antennas in both locations. In Australia, the antennas will, look, will be small, uh, looking like a small uh, Christmas trees. And on Australia, um, on South Africa, sorry, they will be dishes, as you can see here. Um, why are the, the telescopes going to be in South Africa and Australia? Well, uh, when looking for a location, uh, one of the most important elements was the radiation. And as you can see here, the selected areas be here and here are have very low radi radiation compared to other areas like our headquarters that is here. Uh, radiation is a very key element to successfully operate a radio telescope, and that's why we chose these areas. But um, we've, we've talked about the, the project and the location, but what drives the project? What is the goal of this telescope that we want to build? Well, the answer is simple. We want to explore the history of the universe to reply the big questions like, uh, how do planets form? Or are we alone in the universe? Was Einstein right with general rel relativity? Or what is dark matter? And many more that we expect to provide an answer with our telescope. To reply to these questions, SKU will bring together a wealth of the world's finest scientists, engineers, and policymakers. Now I will move to the procurements of 2020 activity and the planning of 2021 for at SKU. To understand our procurement strategy, it is important to consider that many of SKO's stakeholders have already invested a fortune and more than 10 years in developing the technologies during the pre-construction phase of SKA-1. These stakeholders express their interest in having a continuity between the pre-construction and construction phases. And we have listened to them and have developed an appropriate SKA-1 procurement strategy that can meet stakeholders' strategic objectives. Inevitably, procurement outcomes and funding have become conflated by the situation where countries will say, we will only give you X million euros if we know that we will undertake Y package of work. So what in this case, while a competitive procurement model can deliver a very reasonable percentage of fair work return, it does not necessarily guarantee continuity between pre-construction and construction work. That is why uh, most of SKA-1 construction activities are therefore conditionally allocated to specific member countries. This procurement model can offer the level of continuity sought by our stakeholders. However, we will try to maximize the healthy competition within the national markets whenever possible. Once I have presented our procurement strategy, I would like to show you our procurement process. The procurement process is divided into stages, as you can see here. Stage one was successfully completed, and it was the conditional allocation of contract opportunities between the members and the observatory, always taking into account the fair work return. So we, with this stage, we achieve a fair work return in an early stage of the project. 
And now we are getting ready for stage two, it will be this part here, which will start at T0 or what is the same, July 2021, with the transactional business of sourcing commercial contracts from suppliers within the predefined national market, as mentioned before. There is a number of steps that we need to take before T0, uh, what, I, what I mentioned before, that is stage two of the procurement process. So on the 5th and the 6th of November, the final council preparatory task of CPTF meeting will, will take place. Then by December, we expect to have the first IEO council meeting where the policies previously endorsed by CPTF will hopefully be approved and the SK1 construction proposal will be presented for approval. Then moving into 2021, from January to June, we will move to the formal transi transition from the current UK company to the IGO. And at the same time, we will start the contract preparation period in order to get ready for July 2021, when the SK1 construction plan shall be approved then the tendering process for SKA1 will start and the first SKA1 contract will be awarded. The official start of the construction work in Australia and South Africa should happen around January, 2022. This is what we estimate. As mentioned before, during the first half of 2021, we will focus on getting ready for T0. And to do so, we will further our ERP system development, we want to finalize the contract tender packs. Uh, we want to roll out and embed the SKO procurement policies and procedures. Uh, we want to develop and implement our procurement web portal where there will be a supplier portal at the same time and that we will use for the tendering. And we will also like to ramp out our procurement capacity or what is the same staffing. Staffing and getting ready for July 2021, when the conditionally allocated contract opportunities will be advertised in the countries where the contracts have been conditionally allocated only. Then the individual delivery plans and the outline of procurement plans will have been finalized. And the ILOs will understand what contract opportunities are available, are available to their contracts. From this moment, there will be a significant tendering activity during a very restrictive period. That will be a bit of the procurement uh, that we have planned. And now I would like to move on to the last part of the presentation, uh, where we want to highlight a couple of challenges among the many that the construction of the observatory will face. First of the challenges will be the data challenge. One of our biggest challenges when the observatory is working full capacity will be the data collection and storage. We expect that by 2024, the amount of data that will be collected and storage will be something around 600 petabytes, which is 600 times greater than the amount of, of data collected in 2017. Well, as you can see, it's a, it's a huge difference. But um, there were, the data will be collected on the telescope, but there will also be a series of SKU regional centers that you can see on this map here, where the data will be analyzed. And, that, and this will be spread among different countries. So data will be collected here, but we will also have another center. So the challenge is not only the data collection and archive, but also the data flow from the science data processor centers that will be South Africa and Australia, to the SKO regional centers spread around the world, are spread around the world. But this challenge, will be, we will have to worry about it once the construction phase is, is finished and the, the telescope is operating. We have another challenge that will, it's currently on and that really worries us. And this, this is sustainability. We are very concerned about building a sustainable observatory. And that's why we are considering environmental, social, and economic factors in the developing of these uh, telescopes. We want something that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. 
We are aware of the impact of the construction of the observatory, and we would like to implement a series of actions to minimize it. So we have, for example, divide the power consumption into three innovative design solutions. We are looking for renewable energy options. Uh, we will use video conferences to limit international travels, or we are also developing and implementing an SKO climate action plan that has already a number of local initiatives in place. So this will be all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope this has interested you to keep up with us. Now I will leave the, the floor to my colleague, um, Ian Hastings. Thank you very much, Laura. So if anybody has any questions, uh, particularly questions related to the to the timeline or to the procurement process, I'm um, I'm here to provide answers, hopefully. Thank you very much, Laura, for your presentation. And thank you uh, to you also, Ian, for your availability for answering the questions. So we will see if we have uh, some questions for the audience. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, both. Uh, yes, we have received uh, one question. Tendering is set to start from July 2021. When are the first market surveys expected to be used to companies via the ILO? Okay, I can answer that question. So okay. as, as mentioned by, uh, as Laura mentioned during her presentation, our um, project is extremely allocated. So, you know, I think uh, uh, it's very similar to ITA in many ways in that the various stakeholders funding the pro project wanted a, a lot of security and they wanted effectively guarantees that they would be able to continue with pre-construction work into construction. So I think it's very important that people, if you come away with nothing else from this presentation, other than the fact that, for example, the UK government knows what we'll be buying in the UK. The Canadian government knows what we'll be buying in Canada. The Spanish government has a good idea of what we'll be buying in Spain. And, and the ILO, the ILO networks, so the ILO networks already really know what we'll be buying from their individual country. So, but, so to, but to answer directly the question, we would hope to start uh, tendering, uh, well, advertising opportunities within the various countries. There will still be some opportunities uh, that are open to everybody, uh, more on the indirect work, like for example, insurances or banking services, travel services, all these indirect services, of which, you know, which account for quite a considerable amount of money, more operational stuff will be open to everybody. But the SKA one uh, construction activity, it's restrictive tendering and the tenders will be restricted to the countries that, owe, that effectively are in pole position with the allocation. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, will the procurement lead by the IGO or by the member states in kind? Uh, the the by definition the in kind the well by definition in kind is always the member state that actually carries out the actual procurement unless you know, that that's the way in kind works isn't it? Okay, um, I think there are no more questions uh, for you. Uh, maybe I have one. Um, Laura has, has been talking about uh, the challenges, um, but uh, in which uh, technological areas are you going to, to need the support of industry? Um, well, well, we can't, but the, the, this is an incredibly, uh, uh, it's a bought out telescope. So we're the design authority for the telescope, but uh, we need, uh, but industry is involved all the way in, in terms of its construction. And it's a very varied and interesting project in many respects, because we're building an array there's an awful lot of things which aren't normally aren't perhaps aren't so associated with these big science uh, 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 projects. For example, 130,000 off uh, low antennas is you know you don't normally get these sort of volumes in a big science infrastructure project. Uh, we're building a, a run, an aircraft, uh, a small airport in Australia to service the low uh, observatory. You don't normally get to do this kind of thing in um, in, in big science infrastructure projects either. So it, the the rate, so we you know, but we're entirely reliant upon industry for everything we do. We we won't mm -hmm. we we won't succeed in this. Uh, you know, we've built a paper telescope, 
and we now need to turn it into a we we now need to build it into a physical manifestation and and it's industry that will be industry that will be helping us to do this mm -hmm. okay thank you very much uh, no more questions uh, for you so thanks again both Thank you, Thank you uh, again to Laura and to Ian. So I, I assume that the key contact uh, f uh, with respect uh, to the in-kind contributions are the ILOs in each of the countries that uh, will have uh, full information about what is uh, reserved for the... For the yes, yeah. That, yeah, that, 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 that's the big takeaway, Jorge. The, yeah. the, the, we, had a CP, we had a council preparatory task force meeting on the 17th, uh, well, the, uh, 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 earlier last month, and at that meeting, all the allocations were the conditional allocations were uh, were endorsed, so the ILOs know exactly what each of the countries uh, are expected to be that the that the components and the products and the services and the goods that they'll be providing to the observatory during the construction phase. Very well. So this is this is clear, and now industry knows uh, where to get the information. Yes. Thank you very much to both. It has been a pleasure to have you both on, uh, on board this webinar. Uh, and and th thank you again. My pleasure. Now, thank you, Jorge. Now we are going to our last but not least uh, speaker um, 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 of, of the day. Um, we have with us, uh, of course, Force for Energy um, uh, with the European um, um, Opportunities for, uh, for ITER. Uh, we have with uh, with us we have uh, two speakers, uh, Victor Saez and Leonardo Biagioni. Um, uh, uh, good afternoon uh, to both, uh, and um, thank you for being with us, uh, Victor. Uh, the floor is yours. Go ahead. So Jorge, how will we start? See, we uh, see uh, we see your your presentation perfectly. Okay, uh, I will start, Jorge, and then we'll hand over to Victor. Very well. Uh, so thank you, Jorge. Thank you, everybody. And good morning to all the, the viewers. Uh, we will try not to take too much of your time. It's almost lunch time, so we understand that you may all be eager to move on. In uh, about 15 minutes, we will try to explain who we are, what we do, and what is coming up next in our project. Next slide, Victor, please. So Fusion for Energy, uh, which we represent, uh, uh, is the European Agency for ITER and the Development of Fusion Energy. It's a European Union agency. We're based in Barcelona, but we have offices elsewhere in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and of course, as the name implies, uh, we deal at the moment mostly with ITER. ITER, as probably most of you know, is uh, uh, a large uh, um, scientific installation which is under construction in the south of France. Uh, but as you will see in a second, ITER is definitely not uh, our full scope. We have more on our plate. Uh, we are funded uh, mostly under the European Union budget, which means that we follow the European Union budgeting cycle. And uh, I'm sure that you've been reading in the news that the budget for the next seven years, 2021, 2027, is not approved yet. And therefore we're waiting as much as anybody else to see uh, what our leaders will decide. But in any case, just to give you an order of magnitude about where we stand, uh, we have uh, received between 20, 2008 and 2020, uh, let's say around uh, uh, 6.8 billion euros, uh, constant value, which corresponds to, let's say 7.5, real euros or so money which we, we spent and out of these we have spent more than five billion with industry most of our activities in fact are um, contracts which are placed uh, to uh, industry for the manufacturing of uh, the the different components of the ether uh, facility. For the next seven years, we uh, have an estimate of uh, a little bit more than 5 billion euros. And again, most of these will go into the, um, the ETA construction. Next slide, please, Victor. As I said, ITER is not uh, uh, all of our activity. Uh, we have uh, several uh, significant projects uh, which we are taking care of. 
uh, in particular, in now in the short term, in fact, it's a, a machine and installation which is uh, complete and about to start its operations. We are, collab we are managing the collaboration with Japan uh, for the JT60 uh, SA uh, Tokamak. It's, it's built in Japan. In the medium term, again, ITER main item, but an important item uh, in uh, our plan, uh, which is called the European Roadmap for Fusion, is the support for the IFMIF Dones facility in Granada. And this was already described yesterday by uh, Angeli Barra. Uh, uh, Fusion for Energy is planned to have a significant contribution to this facility and a significant role in its construction. And then in the longer term, uh, of course, uh, ITER is not the, the end of the, of the activity, in the, the end of the, of the road to fusion. Uh, there are going to be other machines. For the moment, our reference is the demo, which is the demonstration fusion reactor, the demo project, which will, however, come uh, relatively, I mean, relatively far in the future, definitely beyond uh, 2030. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I mentioned that most of our uh, activities are ITER related. So here you have uh, in the on the screen uh, the master schedule for the ITER project, which shows uh, that ITER will be built in, in different steps. Uh, so we, there will be several construction milestones uh, um, and uh, inter, uh, in, uh, in between the different construction milestones, there will be operational uh, operation phases. So the first construction milestone is the so-called first plasma, which is when the machine or the most uh, the, the, the majority of the machine, let's say, will be installed. The machine will be ready to to start some operation. This is planned for 2025. Uh, but then there are other important. Um, milestones uh, uh, for the so-called prefusion, uh, or, or prefusion phase one, prefusion phase two, and then in 2035, uh, everything will be complete and, uh, and the ITER machine will then proceed for the final operations to uh, fully demonstrate uh, the feasibility, the, the industrial feasibility of fusion power. Next slide, please, Victor. Uh, here you have uh, a zoom, in fact, on the on the first uh, phase of the activities. Most of, or in fact, the majority of uh, the contributions which build up to the first plasma have uh, already been, uh, uh, the contracts have already been signed. So we are already under construction. In fact, we are already delivering. We delivered the, uh, the, the first and the second uh, superconducting uh, um, the magnets, large superconducting coils uh, already this year. Other items were also delivered in previous years. And now in the next five years until 2024, 2025, we will uh, complete the, the deliveries for the first plasma. Next slide, please. But uh, as you've seen from the budget, uh, in fact, as much is still to come because we are now either procuring or we're about to procure all the components which will made up the following steps in the machine construction and which Victor uh, will just present uh, in a few minutes. I'm just, uh, before handing over to Victor, in fact, uh, I just want to, to clarify that, of course, uh, some of the big components um, are now under construction, so we will not have in the future uh, a lot of large magnets, a lot of large vacuum vessels. There will not be um, a lot of, you know, this heavy infrastructure, which was the most part of our uh, procurements uh, until 2020. But there are still going to be some significant procurements and there are still going to be significant uh, uh, civil infrastructure activities uh, because uh, there are, um, the buildings uh, hosting uh, the, the machine are almost completely a responsibility of the European uh, contribution. We have already delivered some buildings, uh, but there are more coming uh, and Victor will spend some time about this. So in, I now uh, hand over to Victor. I suggest if there are questions about this first part that we just wait until the end and we go for the questions all in one go. Thank you, Victor, please. Okay, thank you, Leonardo.
Well, prior to get into the details of the forthcoming business opportunities, I would like to recall the existence of our FRA industry portal that you have the link on the top of the slide there, because this is the one-stop shop for FRE, for Fusion for Energy, to contact or to make publicity of our business opportunities. So in case that any of you have not registered and that you are interested in the kind of activities that we have for procuring, I will highly suggest that you register uh, there. As you can see in our website, there is a, a section called calls, actually, where we have information about the call for tenders that are published. The ones that you have on the screen now, for instance, are all the call for tenders which are currently open. I will not elaborate uh, in the slides, in the, in the subsequent slides about these call for tenders because, well, first they have been already published and then you can click here and have the details about uh, these call for tenders in case you, you need. Then I will also want to take the, the opportunity to express our gratitude and appreciation for the work of the ILOs who are essential for the success of our procurement activities and with whom we are in constant contact. So you see in this uh, circle here, there in case that you don't know the ILO corresponding to your uh, country, then you can there, you can go there and check so that you can contact them because they have first-hand information about our activities. Now I will move to the forthcoming business opportunities. I will begin with the <clears throat> Invesel, the 1080. The target for this call for tender is November this year. And this is about the need for ITER. Uh, we, ITER will need about 8.5 kilometers of 316 LN stainless steel cooling pipes to cool down, to cool down the first wall. So the, the pipes and the supports together, they are called the manifold, and you can see them on the on the right on the on the on the picture. A market survey was published in February this year. And as I was mentioning, we are ready to publish within a few weeks. Then uh, we also have the 1094. The purpose of this contract, of this call for tender, is to have some advanced audit capabilities, auditing capabilities to help FRE in the management of a specific kind of cost, cost plus fee contracts that we have for the manufacturer of the blanket first wall panels. We also have in this project team, in the imbecile, we also have the 1112. Uh, the market survey is closed for this uh, call for tender and the call is expected to be uh, to be published in the first quarter of 2021. The subject matter of this call is the procurement of pins, slips, and links at uh, around 4,700 units made of a steel 660 or aluminum bronze that will be used to attach some of the components of the diverter. I'm referring to the inner vertical target, the outer vertical target and the dome that will have to be bolted in, the, in their frames using these pink sleeves and links. Let's move now to diagnostics. On this, we have the first one, the 1084. This call for tender is addressed to operators of radiation test facilities to test some of the, of some components. Actually, we have uh, an info day on this specific call for tender today at 2 p.m. So in case that any of you were interested on this, you are welcome to register and to go to the industry portal and to participate in the info day for this call for tender. Then we have uh, the 1126. This, I'd like to, under, uh, underline, this is a particularly interesting business opportunity with a budget going beyond 20 million euros because there are many components here. We have optical, mechanical, cab cables, uh, ETC. So having regarded the heterogeneous nature of this contract, we will be expecting to receive bids mainly from integrators seeking to have the support of subcontractors or partners to cover the full scope of the contract. 
So a market survey could be launched before the end of the year, hopefully, and most likely that we may have also an info day to facilitate and to foster the contacts between potential partners. Although we don't have a date yet, but I think that this is a call for tender that it's worth uh, taking a look into. Then we move, as Leonardo was mentioning, to the buildings. The first one, the site buildings and power supplies. We have the TV21, which is going to be published uh, before the end of the, of the year, hopefully, which deals with the retrofit and finishing works for the Tokamak complex and surrounding buildings. The market survey for this call for tender was published in July, and it's now closed, and it raised quite a lot of interest interest from the people having regard the, the number of different skills which are needed for, uh, for running this contract, even though all these different skills are related to civil engineering, civil work. The total amount foreseen for this contract goes beyond 150 million euros, which is quite a, a, a quantity, and it will be shared across six lots. Namely, facility services is the first lot. Then we will have extractoral and other metal works. Another lot for site works, infrastructure and waterproofing. Then another one for cladding, roofing and finishing. Yet another one for electrical, instrumentation and control, fire detection and earthing and lightning works. And finally, there will be uh, another lot for mechanical, uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, and fluids. So the publication of this TV20 and TV21 uh, call for tender is, as I was mentioning, it is very, very close. It's imminent. And then we have the hot cell complex. If I made a joke, this is going to be the hot thing for the next year, because the hot cell com complex is a key facility in the design of data project. You have here in the in the link you know, on the screen, you have the details of the info day. So the details and presentations of the info day that were presented on the 4th of June. I will not deal on this very much because, uh, well, you have there all the information, but well, just some few notes that uh, to put you into the, in the context. As I was mentioning, the, the hot cell complex is key. It, is, it consists of three buildings of nuclear class, the hot cell building, the road waste and the personal access and control buildings. This is a, a big procurement package and the procurement will be shared between ITER International Organization and Fusion for Energy. So the project integration will be shared between FRE and IO. Then ITER IO will be responsible for the road waste and the remote handling system works. And then Fusion for Energy will be responsible for civil works, building services, and mechanical and electrical works. So I will recommend that you take a close look on uh, our website again and the ITER.io website, because for sure, this very big contract, uh, we will have to be publishing some further information because, uh, well, I think it is it is worth informing the, the supply chain uh, prior to launch of the of the call for tender. Then we move into antennas and plasma engineering. Uh, the, we have here the 1120. The scope of this contract is the final design, manufacture, assembly, testing, and delivery of the electron cyclotron upper launcher plaque, which you can see on the on the left, and X vessel web guide systems. A market survey for this uh, call for tender was published on the 30th of July. It is closed now. And the answers have been shared among the respondents on, on some few days ago, on Tuesday, 22nd of September. Because in, in our market surveys, we sometimes we give the opportunity for those attending, or sorry, for the respondents to a market survey, whether they are interested in that their name is shared with other potential uh, with other respondents so that they can create uh, well potential partnerships this was the case and then the names have been shared between each other some few days ago the value of this contract is high a bit uh, below 100 million euros so again this is uh, a big contract we will also have as uh, you can see on the screen the op 1042 which will be only launched after the the 
the 1120 is launched, which will provide support to FRE, uh, is support to the owner for such a big contract. I think, uh, Victor, it's yes. maybe just to provide the scale, uh, the, the picture you see of the plug, uh, you should think this is something more or less the size of a minibus. Yes. So it's a not a small component, not a small uh, subsystem. It's a pretty large subsystem. Indeed. Okay, now we are moving into supporting activities. There we have to call for tender about to be launched on nuclear safety. The first one refers to <clears throat> nuclear safety support through safety analysis. This safety analysis will shall comply with the French nuclear regulations and the guidelines of the French Nuclear Safety Authority. And then we have also uh, another one, the second, uh, the second nuclear safety uh, call for tender on, inspect, on inspection support, which may include uh, resident experts actually inspectors to work at the premises of FRE either in Barcelona in, in Barcelona or in in Cadarache. So there was some ex ante publicity for these activities published in our industry portal on the 24th of, of July of, of this year. In supporting activities also we have the 1106. This call for tender relates to support services in the field of CE marking and regulatory compliance with uh, related to safety of machinery, pressure equipment, electrical equipment, and so on and so forth. So this- Victor, call for sorry, you have uh, one, one, uh, one minute or two minutes left, okay? Okay. This call for tender should be published even today or, or, or next week. On Kodak, Control Data Access and Communications, so we had a four-year contract for instrumentation and engineering support which is now coming to an end. And this uh, contract needs to be renewed. Now we will have to, to launch a new contract for addressing these two uh, topics uh, that will be, instead of having one contract with two lots, we will be launching two different call for tenders, the 115 and 116. And then this is the last slide. Uh, we have for the cryoplan and fuel cycle, we have the second stage of the REMS. REMS stands for Radiological and Environmental Monitoring System. The procurement strategy for this system within the ITER project is divided in three stages. First, the REMS, which are necessary for fresh plasma, which are already uh, well uh, undergoing, the, the contracts are undergoing. Then we have the tokamak complex REMS that will be needed for operation after fresh plasma. And finally, the REMS components needed for the commissioning of the hot cell facility. During next year, we intend to begin with the procurement of the second phase of REMS. And a market survey should be published on, in this regard early next year. And then I close uh, with the broader approach that you remember, this is the special cooperation that we have with uh, Jap Japan. We have here a couple of call for tenders. The first one is on the centrifuge on, on the pellet launching system. The pellet launching system serves is a, a system that uh, delivers solid state hydrogen isotopes to the plasma in the GT60 tokamak. It consists of three main components, the extrusion system to create the, the, the solid state hydrogen isotopes, the accelerator and the transfer system. The scope of the contract, it is, you can see on the, on the left uh, on the picture, the scope of this contract refers to the blue shade part of this graphic and should be published before the end of the year. It is called the centrifuge accelerator. And finally, this is the last one I'm referring to. We have a call for tender for the supply and shipment to Japan of 20 units of solid state amplifiers working at 175 megahertz that will replace the existing ones that were installed in the LIPAC accelerator in Rocasso some 10 years ago and that now need to be replaced. So this call for tender should be launched in around in 2021. Um, this is it. You have here a nice picture of the site. I may say that the building that you see on the left is has all already been finished, it has a roof, and it is uh, actually the Tokamak building. So maybe that we 
should consider changing this photo. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for your attention. And then Leonardo and I will be ready for taking questions if you wish. Thank you, Victor. Thank you, Leonardo. Um, it's uh, really a challenging um, activity, the one you have in, uh, in, in Caras. Very well. So let's see if we, we have uh, some questions from the audience. Yes, uh, thank you, Leonardo, Victor. Uh, we have received uh, several questions uh, for you. First one is related to the hot cell. When in time will the hot cell complex call for tender be published? So uh, I think uh, I would take this one, Victor, because first yes. of all, we have to clarify it's not going to be a single call. So That's it. Yes. maybe this was not too clear from the presentation, but... Uh, yes, maybe I, I referred to the call for tender and actually it was wrong. Sorry, it was my, my mistake. It is not a one call for tender. It will be a, a series of them. So mm -hmm. the, the first call, in fact, if you look at the presentation, you will see all the, the details, but the first call is planned for next year. It's going to be essentially a call for engineering activities uh, and then uh, several calls for construction, procurement of um, equipment uh, systems and so forth. Installation will then follow through the, 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 the say, the years, uh, uh, maybe between end of 2021 or probably early 2022, 2023. And uh, the last ones will presumably be in early 2024. Okay, thank you for your answer, Leonardo. Next question, um, will the system of Saurian companies search for complementary skills in order to facilitate partnership as, one, as was done for the antennas and plasma engineering procurement be more regularly used? It is very useful information. You have We... been sharing, yeah, you know, the the yes. companies that uh, were interested in the market survey. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, this is uh, actually something that we could have been used more often and that uh, since we see that there is a request from the side of the industry to, to pursue this approach, we can yes. do it because then we are asking to the participants to an info day or, well, to an info day is easier, but uh, or uh, a market survey whether they want to share their contact details with other participants so that they can connect later and maybe think about potential partnerships. This has proven to be very useful, so we intend to do it regularly. Yes, okay. indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. Next question. Um, thank you. I didn't see in timeline at the beginning uh, of the presentation anything about uh, the helium cool pebble bed test blanket system. Whose design is currently whose design is currently ongoing? Uh, when the construction will be carried out? Um, when will it start being operative? You know, this is a one yes, of the two if, TBM. Correct. In fact, if you look at the slide four, you see the TBM program at the bottom. Uh, I'm trying to share. I don't know if I'm managing. Yes. Yes. That's is it. it. There. So TBM, you okay. see, is, is at the bottom. Uh, clearly, uh, when we refer to the to the completion of the construction, it means the, the full configuration of the machine, including the test blanket systems. So the, the various uh, uh, the various systems coming from the different domestic agencies. Uh, the the construction here you see also here a timeline. You know that the, the TBM. I don't know who asked the question, but. Uh, probably the person knows that this is a program which is uh, uh, jointly pursued between uh, Fusion for Energy, Eurofusion, so the association of the European Fusion Laboratories, and in fact, ITER-IO uh, as well. Uh, so the, the, the construction, the procurement and construction of the different modules uh, will be uh, presumably starting in the late 2020s. Okay. Uh, with uh, yes, with construction then extending in the early 2030s. By 2035, everything is supposed to be uh, available. I mean, everything uh, the the the, TB, the TBS are supposed to be available. Then there will probably be modifications, upgrades, and so forth. The reason why you've not seen it, uh, you've not seen these in the following slide, which is just showing uh, FRE's, uh, FRE's activities 
is essentially because uh, in in the following slide, maybe Victor, if you just move two slides down. Here we are I'm focusing. Trying to. Okay, we are focusing okay. uh, on uh, our procurements during the next seven years, uh, which is what is presently part of the budget proposals uh, under the next uh, European Union multi-year framework, uh, financial framework. Mm -hmm. And th this is our focus. Uh, clearly, uh, it's not going to be over because then uh, we will have uh, in 2027, we will still have another eight years to go until uh, the end of the construction. So there will be uh, a lot more coming also after 2027. But here we are focusing on the next seven years. Okay, thank you. It seems no more questions uh, from the audience. Maybe I, I have one for, for you. Um, if there is a, a first of a kind machine that is now starting the, the assembly phase, but uh, in the way of this impressive uh, success, you have faced uh, a lot of challenges. Uh, maybe Leonardo, Victor, uh, you could give us your impression about uh, which have been the most important challenges. <laughs> well, this is a politically <laughs> sensitive question, I, I think. Uh, um, I think uh, w when, uh, when we look at this from the, when we looked at this and probably those looking at this from the outside see the technological challenges or the, just the scale of the project yeah. uh, as a challenge. I mean, those are definitely difficult aspects. But if I had to pick one, I think uh, it's the complexity of the of the project organization, which is what is really <laughs> taking yeah. most of our <laughs> yeah, time. Uh, now, again, uh, yeah, there are many reasons why you enter this complex uh, governance setup, especially with uh, when when you're thinking about something which uh, uh, will uh, cost uh, several tens of billions and will last for several tens of years. So uh, there's always uh, a difficult discussion there. But this complexity is really uh, causing a lot of the uh, difficulties we have, a lot of interfaces, mm -hmm. uh, design, construction teams scattered all over the world. A, a lot of these project management logistics, these are the things which are never considered when you imagine upfront the yeah. project because mm -hmm. initially everybody focuses on the technological difficulties but then when you get to the real life uh, it's what uh, becomes very very complex yeah <laughs> i agree with you thank you very much uh, no more questions uh, for you so thanks again victor and leonardo i thank you i give the floor thank now you. to yeah. jorge Thank you, Victor. Uh, thank you, Beren. Thank you, Leonardo, uh, for the, this uh, very in interesting uh, last presentation. Uh, and, and thank you. Uh, I also would like to thank all the speakers of uh, today and uh, yesterday uh, because of their um, 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 availability, because of their presentations, and because uh, being uh, on the 15 minutes uh, plus uh, time. Uh, thank you to all of you. It has been a pleasure to have you all. Now, uh, what uh, we are going to do is uh, conclude with some uh, feedback from you um, prior to going to the, the, to the conclusions that will be given by Roberto. So um, and now we are going back to our Slido application. To, so have ready your mobile, okay? If you are not connected, uh, type slido.com and when you get into the system with your uh, PC browser or with your mobile, um, after typing slido.com, uh, enter the code required, which is BSBF. Um, uh, remember, you should not do, you, it is not needed to, to type uh, hashtag, it's only BSBF. So get into the system and be ready for the first question. Okay, we have the first question with us. Among the big science organizations uh, um, presenting uh, in, in this BSB, BS, uh, BF webinar, which are the ones you already uh, are involved in business with or research with? Um, you can enter different uh, and multiple uh, enters. You can ent uh, here you have the list of our presenters. CERN, EMBL, ESA, ESO, ESRF, ESS, European XFEL, FAIR, Fusion for Energy, SCAO, ESS Bilbao, 
EST, Lips and Mirror. Okay, I see everyone is getting uh, business or research with uh, all of them. This is great news. Um, CERN is um, uh, the number one, Fusion for Energy as well, ESS. Uh, there is a big competition, but it's clear that shows that uh, all of the big science organizations uh, today and yesterday representing are of interest of our audience. Thank you very much for this question and your answers. Next question. The next question is of the same type. Uh, but uh, it's which of the big science organizations plans do you feel are more aligned with your business? So if you are an industry or a researcher, which of the plans presented are more aligned with your activities? Uh, so um, CERN, EMBL, ESA, ESO, uh, and, and all of them. Uh, uh, okay, the answer is uh, it's in a different way. It's, it's not in a in a um, cloud mode, but uh, okay, it doesn't matter because we see all the answers from the audience uh, in a row. Uh, it's, uh, it's really challenging seeing that uh, our audience today has so many contacts with those uh, big science organizations. Okay, now we are going to the next one. Uh, Typical question after a webinar, how would you summarize in two words, Max, uh, your experience of this BS via BS uh, webinar, okay? O of course, only positive um, answers are allowed. Huh? <laughs> so feel free to put your, uh, your um, experience uh, with one or two words. Um, you can put as many as you want uh, to share with uh, everyone. Thank you very much for all of this uh, positive and, uh, um, and nice words. Uh, this, is the, this is the purpose, uh, to be useful for all, all of the audience and also um, uh, for the big science organizations. Thank you very much to all. And the last question, uh, is um, okay, what are the topics about the BSBF BF 2021? Uh, would you like to know about in the following BSBF webinars? We are going to have other webinars um, uh, in the next uh, year um, in 2021, um, maybe two or three. Which subject do you, uh, related to BSBF do you, do you like, do you, you would like to have it uh, um, in the BSBF uh, webinar. Okay, COVID impact, ILO, CU association, PERIA, um, SME participation, renewable energy, space. Uh, okay, IT organization, ILO network, COVID impact, COVID impact. Okay, so I see a lot of uh, subjects. We'll, we'll take note, okay? So thank you very much. This, this ends our last um, Slido carousel. Uh, thank you all for your participation in the Slido carousel. It makes uh, more friendly this kind of webinars. And with this, I will um, pass my, um, the floor to Roberto Trigo that will, uh, will go with the conclusions of the webinar and I will close the webinar. Go ahead, uh, Roberto, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Jorge. Um, I would uh, just like to, to also join you in, in thanking the, the speakers and the participants. Uh, I think I, I saw that uh, the word useful was uh, was very um, big in the in the screen uh, after the slide. And this is this is precisely what we wanted with this with this webinar of today's. Uh, we, we wanted it to be useful for you. We try to give you in two days a summary of the most relevant uh, industrial opportunities in terms of procurement in the biggest um, uh, scientific organizations in, in Europe uh, and also uh, the, um, the plans ahead in order to, to, to help you plan uh, also your, uh, your to, to help you prepare this, uh, these future opportunities. Uh, hopefully we uh, in, in, in 2021 in the BSBF uh, you will have uh, much more opportunities for networking and for getting to know more in depth 
uh, all these uh, opportunities that, that might arise. So I encourage you to, to join the, the BSBF and you have there the uh, BSB, your, our, our web in bsbf2021.org uh, to, to prepare for, for, for next year. Uh, we will, uh, we have in, in preparation as announced uh, our next uh, webinar in, in technology transfer. I, I, um, we also hope that you, you will find this um, interesting. Presentations uh, as also informed will be available in, in, in our web um, as well. And if you have further comments regarding this webinar, you can also use the, the contact information in our web for, for that. It will be uh, also useful for us. So I, I wouldn't like to, to take uh, much more of your time today. Uh, have a very nice weekend and, uh, and goodbye.